Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about a new discovery of yet another unusual thing out there in space and this time it seems that we've observed the creation of an actual moon around a planet. In other words, we might have discovered a first ever baby exomoon. And I wanted to start with this, this is a kind of a telescopic zoom to the location where this object is. This object was actually uh, talked about last year, it's known as PDS-70, because we've discovered an exoplanet there, and it was very easily visible and uh, was confirmed by various sources. You're about to see it right here any second now. Now this object was obviously very interesting to us because, well, even though it's far, it's like 370 light years away from us, it does allow us to finally answer the question of creation of the solar system and creation of other stars. And this is what it sort of looks like if you zoom into it with a telescope. You can see the actual protoplanetary disk and the planet right there, very close to the star. Okay, actually very close is a relative term because the distance between the center of the star system here and the planet is pretty much the same as the distance from the sun to um, a planet like Neptune. So it is pretty far. But the protoplanetary disk is quite visible and as is the planet that's forming there. This object is also relatively young, it's only about 10 million years old, so that's why a lot of scientists started to study it. And the scientists from a uh, university in Texas discovered something really, really cool about it. They discovered that, well, first of all, there are two planets now, and that it seems to be absorbing a lot of nearby hydrogen and creating a kind of a disk within a disk. Basically, a circumplanetary disk, very similar to what planets like Jupiter have um, next to them. In other words, it's creating a disk that might one day then form um, objects that are moons. And all of this of course coincides with the creation story that we have for the moons of our own um, gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn and of course objects like Neptune and Uranus. We believe that all of this obviously starts um, after the so-called giant molecular cloud from which stars and planets form has already collapsed and created the protoplanetary disk which we can sort of recreate right here in Universe Sandbox and then this protoplanetary disk uh, starts forming clumps of objects that will eventually form protoplanets and that will then form planets. Some of these clumps will be large enough and massive enough, uh, usually over 10 or so masses of Earth, to create a kind of a core-like object that will start producing a gap in this particular ring. And this gap will start growing larger and larger as this object absorbs more and more of this protoplanetary dust. But eventually it will also start kind of gathering these particles around itself and these particles will literally form another ring around this object. And as this planet grows bigger and bigger, it will also have bigger and bigger ring. And so there's literally a kind of a system within the system where this will then start forming into moons that are similar to moons like the one you see right here, or the moons of Jupiter that we all know, Io, Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto. Um, all of these moons we believe were formed this way, and this is kind of how we think usually X moons would form as well. And we weren't really sure until we saw evidence, and by looking at the system PDS-70 and looking at what's happening here, with a little bit of a ring forming right there, we're now almost certain that this is exactly how it happens. And all of this is of course possible because no disk is perfect and every disk is going to have some sort of imperfection and higher density in certain regions that will then collapse and create larger and larger objects. So um, if the disk was obviously perfect, none of this would happen. But because of these imperfections, eventually they create these objects that we call planets. Now, as you can see here, there are two planets. One of them is uh, PDS-70C at a distance of roughly around uh, 30 astronomical units from the center. But this one here is a little bit closer and um, it's called 70B and it has something unusual coming off it. And the scientists behind this paper refer to this as an anomaly. There's a very unusual tail-like formation that they've detected um, very close to this planet that seems to be like its own entity now. It's behaving as if it's basically some kind of a protoplanetary um, cloud or something related to a very large, very massive collection of protoplanetary mass in a sense. 
but we don't really know how to explain it, why it's formed, and why this object doesn't seem to have the same kind of a formation around it as its partner planet. So in other words, even though we answered one question, once again we kind of ended up having a lot more questions as a result of this observation. Uh, on the other hand, it's also very interesting to know how exactly they were able to discover all of this. And to be able to see this, the scientists behind this paper had to not only look at this planet with visual light, but they also had to look at it with infrared light, and also by looking at the very specific spectrum of hydrogen. So in other words, they were looking at it from three different perspectives, and then combined all of them to see, instead of just this, this. The three observations that they performed allowed them to see what we didn't really see before, and they also created this new technique that will allow us to use this in other objects around the galaxy, and most likely help us discover other very unusual objects out there. We also learned a little bit more about these planets as well. We know that uh, this object is anywhere from 1 to maybe 10 masses of Jupiter, so it's a very very massive planet, as is this one. And the star itself is not as massive as our Sun, it's only about 90% the mass of the Sun. So there is a very very large possibility for PDS-70C to have very large planetary sized moons, possibly even mass of Earth. But because this system is still very very young, it's only 10 million years old, and because all of this is still sort of evolving and is happening basically in real time, we don't really know what's going to happen there in the next billion years or so. For all we know, this planet, uh, this tremendously massive planet, is going to turn into a hot Jupiter and eventually either fall into the star or get rejected by the star system and become its own sort of massive brown dwarf-like object. So I guess for now, uh, the most important part of the study is that we've discovered uh, what seems to be the first ever formation of the exomoon somewhere out there in the galaxy. And at the same time, we've discovered a new interesting technique that we can use later on in the future to study various exoplanets and various star systems. We can now look at uh, the same object using optical uh, telescopes, we can look at it using very specific infrared um, telescope, and also by using a hydrogen spectrum analysis to try to see the whole picture while looking at the star system and then possibly see what's happening there in a lot more detail than previously. So in other words, this officially makes PDS-70 one of the most exciting star systems out there, allowing us to study the history of our own solar system, but also allowing us to answer mysteries of the universe that we couldn't really answer before. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and welcome to Saturn. Today we're going to be talking about a new discovery coming from this beautiful planet, related to its spin or its rotation. There are still a lot of mysteries around various planets, including of course Saturn, but the thing is, one of the biggest mysteries of this unusual planet is that it seems to have changed its rotation speed over the past uh, 20 to 30 years or so, by just a tiny amount, but roughly around 1% or so. But how could we possibly discover all of this? Well, it actually started back in 1979 to 1980, when the Voyager probes passed by Saturn and were able to measure its rotation. These beautiful probes, one of which you can see right here on the screen, are traveling through the interstellar space right now and are still sort of sending some of the data to us. Now, one day they'll die, but not yet. Anyway, so when these probes were just beginning their um, scientific life, the scientists behind this mission made it so that the probes were able to use the so-called slingshot maneuver to use both Jupiter and Saturn, and for Voyager 2, even Neptune and Uranus, to accelerate a little bit and to get extra speed so that they could eventually leave the solar system. So here is the Voyager 1 spacecraft as it passes behind Jupiter and gains that extra velocity that will then take it to Saturn. And as you can see, it's now on the way to Saturn. While passing by these planets, the probes were able to get enough data to allow us to study Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune in detail that was not available to us before this. And of course some of the data was in regards to the rotation speed and other properties of the planets themselves. And so for Jupiter we were able to discover that it was the fastest spinning object in the solar system, but for Saturn we discovered that a single rotation here takes about 10 hours and 40 minutes. And this number was obviously confirmed by both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, so there was no reason for us to doubt that this number was correct. 
But then we of course had another brilliant mission, Cassini, that spent a long time around Saturn studying pretty much everything about it and its moons as well. And the Cassini mission was also able to measure quite accurately the rotation of the planet, but discovered something a little bit different. And this is where the mystery began. This was back in 2004, and we didn't really know why and what's really happening here. For both Jupiter and Saturn, they release a type of a radio wave from the upper atmosphere that we could technically see from Earth. But the Jupiter's waves do go through the atmosphere of our own planet, and thus we can see it with radio telescopes located on our, on our planet. But for Saturn, the frequency is a little bit different, and it just so happens that that frequency is absorbed by the upper atmosphere of Earth. So none of the radio telescopes from planet Earth can be used to study Saturn. And for this reason, it's always been a bit of a mystery to us. We can only use um, either probes that come close to Saturn, or more specifically telescopes that are orbiting planet that don't get influenced by the Earth's atmosphere. So in other words, it's always been kind of difficult for us to study the atmosphere of this beautiful planet, but nevertheless scientists managed to study it quite well, especially when the Cassini mission spent a few years here. But in order to answer the discrepancy in measurements between the Voyager probes and the Cassini probes, the scientists really started thinking outside of the box. Specifically, they had to start creating various models, including this mechanical model that was created by the scientists behind the paper that was recently released, and try to understand how is it possible that essentially Saturn seems to have changed its rotation. Now the paper that talks about this is in the description below, so you can read this by yourself if you'd like, but the idea is not actually that complicated. And to try to understand all of this, we need to take a look at the differences between Jupiter and Saturn. So here's Jupiter and here are the moons of Jupiter. This is what their orbits look like um, in comparison to the orbits of everything else. Now let's take a look at Saturn. So right away you might see that the orbits of moons of Saturn are a little bit different. Specifically, here's what they look like um, in comparison to the um, plane of the solar system. As you can see, Saturn is actually sort of tilted, just like another planet that we're very familiar with. The um, planet I'm talking about is of course Earth, and both Saturn and Earth have a relatively similar tilt. For Earth, it's about 23 and a half degrees. For Saturn, this angle here is about um, 27 degrees. In other words, both Saturn and Earth are two planets that experience seasons. Both Saturn and Earth have winter, summer, and possibly fall and spring, but winter and summer for sure. And this of course implies that both planets receive different amount of uh, sunlight in different hemispheres. And this is where things get really, really interesting. So it turns out, according to the scientists behind this paper, not only does the atmosphere of Saturn sort of accelerate in rotation, but it also seems to have different speed of rotation depending on the hemisphere. So let's just call them Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere just for the sakes of making it a little bit easier to understand. So the Southern Hemisphere here receives a lot less sunlight compared to the Northern counterpart. And because of this, um, there is a very strange interaction between the plasma that's formed in the upper atmosphere and the atmosphere itself. If we take a look at this model right here, you'll notice that the scientists were able to recreate this using essentially mechanical wheels, and they presented two hemispheres um, as the, these two different atmospheres. And then there is a ring of plasma that's created by the interaction between the ultraviolet light of our own sun and the magnetosphere and also other um, upper atmosphere parts of Saturn. So in other words, as this plasma forms due to the interaction with the UV light from the sun, it actually starts slowing down one of the um, hemispheres. And the atmosphere in that hemisphere starts spinning a little bit slower due to the drag from this plasma that interacts with some of the layers of the atmosphere. Now, it might sound complicated, but essentially think of this as this right here, a kind of a magnetic break that this plasma creates. So as there is more plasma in the north, the north starts getting slowed down by the interaction with plasma and spins a little bit slower. Not a lot, possibly about 1% slower, but still slower enough to be noticeable. And then the atmosphere that stays in the dark doesn't receive as much UV light and for this reason obviously spins a little bit faster because the rotation is not slowed down by the plasma. So in other words, our current understanding or technically our simulations of Saturn are a little bit inc incorrect because the upper part sometimes spins a little bit slower than the lower part. 
And this of course might allow us to explain certain things about various um, unusual patterns around Saturn's atmosphere that we still can't really explain. Now we're not really sure what all of this implies just yet because it's a very recent study, but this does explain why we were able to observe those unusual variations in data between Voyager and Cassini, and at the same time explains that other planets except for our own planet Earth seem to have seasonal changes that do affect them quite dramatically. And I'm sure that following this study we'll be able to possibly explain some of the other unusual effects that we've observed on Saturn, and maybe even explain um, the storms on planets like Jupiter. Now this discovery doesn't imply that the core of Saturn also spins faster or slower depending on the uh, conditions and the seasons, it only talks about the atmosphere itself. We're currently not entirely sure if there is even a core inside, but if there is a solid core similar to a terrestrial planet inside of this object, then it's very likely that it's not really affected by any of this. So this only applies to the atmosphere, it only applies to the rotation of the gas layer on top of the planet. But what's really interesting is that now, because we're pretty much sure that this is what's happening here, it would be very interesting to see if um, other seasonal changes affect other objects here as well. Because we know that there is obviously objects like Titan that have very thick atmosphere, and for the longest time I've personally been calling this the most Earth-like object in the solar system, mostly because of various conditions that are present here, but this also implies that it's very likely Titan has these seasons and they might affect the uh, moon as well. Now we still are not really sure what's really happening here and how all of this affects uh, these objects, but this will definitely create a new field of study specifically related to seasons of various planets that are not Earth. Although because the single orbit of Saturn takes about 29 years, it also means that seasons here last very long. Basically imagine having like 5 or 6 years of summer and then 5 or 6 years of winter. Well anyway, so that's kind of all we've learned about Saturn from this new paper, and if you'd like to learn more, check out the paper in the description below. For now though, I think it's a pretty cool discovery, it definitely explains a lot of things that we didn't understand before, and we were finally able to answer well, pretty much a 40 year old mystery, because since the Voyager probe discovered the original rotation speed and then Cassini had a completely different result, scientists were kind of scratching their head and were thinking that maybe it was just a data problem. But this particular study definitely clarifies a lot of things, and at the same time explains that this plasma that forms in the atmosphere or above the atmosphere of these gas giants is a really really powerful force. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in this video we're going to go back to Mars, and we're going to talk about a relatively recent discovery that actually changes our understanding of Martian evolution, planetary evolution, and to some extent how atmospheres and liquid water work. What we've discovered very very recently is that apparently Mars had liquid water a lot longer than we actually thought it did. Now by now you should probably know that Mars is a very inhospitable place. It's very very dry, it's also quite radioactive due to all kinds of cosmic radiation, and it also has only um, about half a percent of atmospheric pressure compared to Earth. Basically here you're not going to survive for very long. And the fact that its atmosphere is so so low, and also the fact that it's actually kind of cold here for the most part, is why there's really no liquid water here. We've seen some signs of potential liquid water flow and uh, scientists have speculated maybe it was because um, it was actually really really salty, so called brine water, but we've really not seen anything. In terms of the actual water flow, um, well, we might be able to see it one day, but we still haven't. So uh, it was really strange when scientists very recently discovered that, well apparently, and here's actually one of those uh, things I'm going to be talking about, these rivers here have actually had the liquid water a lot longer than we thought. So the relatively recent study that you can see right here um, is called Persistence of Intense Climate Driven Off Runoff Late in Mars History. This study essentially talks about how, it turns out, Mars had liquid rivers for about two and a half billion years longer than, uh, well, pretty much lakes and uh, oceans. This beautiful but dry planet most likely had rivers that were filled with water, actually a lot of water, for much longer than we believed before. So um, when it comes to what we understand about Mars right now is that we thought that all of the water here disappeared about 3.7 billion years ago, 
Um, and this is actually based on observations of things like lakes and, uh, of course, oceans here. And uh, we believe that this happened um, about 800 million years after the creation of Mars. So basically, for the first 800 million years, uh, Mars may have actually looked something like this. It most likely was a world that was filled with liquid water, um, was probably also very warm, and had enough atmospheric pressure to support uh, not just the liquid ocean, but possibly even life. It was actually a lot friendlier to uh, modern life than Earth was. Earth back then was not very friendly to life at all. And uh, we believe that what happened to it over time is that due to the fact that Mars actually has very, very little gravity, about 30% of Earth, and also due to the fact that it either lost its magnetosphere or never really had it, um, it eventually started losing the atmosphere because basically our beautiful sun eventually stripped the atmosphere with all of the solar flares and all of the other super highly energetic particles that um, were striking Martian atmosphere. In other words, it looks something like this. So because there was no magnetosphere, solar flares eventually stripped the atmosphere from Mars, leaving nothing but um, liquid water that also got sort of uh, influenced by the solar wind because a lot of the water particles started to be breaking up into hydrogen and oxygen. And hydrogen is very light, so it just kind of escapes into the outer space, whereas um, oxygen eventually combined with other molecules on the surface, creating this relatively beautiful red hue that you see. So basically, the fact that it's red is because of the oxides, usually um, iron oxides, but also other oxides that created very highly oxidated um, surface of Martian uh, soil that we have today. So that's kind of what we thought happened. And we believe that, um, well, water here slowly disappeared and there was nothing left about 3.7 billion years ago. But it just turns out that the scientists behind the paper I just showed you that you can find in the description below decided to kind of count the potential age of some of the rivers. And so what they actually did was use several locations from known uh, riverbeds on Mars and they decided to use a very old technique of essentially counting craters. Counting craters, and specifically the different sizes of craters, you can kind of relatively accurately estimate the age of something. And they did that for various locations. And what they've discovered is that for a lot of these rivers, the approximate age of some of them suggested that they actually had water for as long as about 1 billion years ago. In other words, Mars potentially had actual liquid water, or at least rivers of liquid water, um, for at least 2.7 billion years more than we actually thought. Now, the most interesting part of this discovery is that some of those rivers were about twice as large as average rivers here on Earth. So, okay, we don't really know the depth of those rivers because it, it's a two-dimensional picture we have. We, we have to kind of go there in person to try to measure the depth. But we know that some of these rivers, in terms of the actual width, were ridiculously big. And they had a lot of water flow. So this wasn't like a small spring or anything. This wasn't even just a temporary river. These rivers existed for billions of years and this suggests that Mars may have actually had several liquid events. So it wasn't just one time that it was wet and liquid. It's very likely that several things happened on the surface here that released water or made water appear for one reason or another. And we're still not really sure why, but this study is actually kind of groundbreaking. This basically suggests that Mars may have actually had several billion years of liquid water on it, and that's more than enough time for, well, life to evolve, actually. And that's a huge discovery. This discovery suggests that Mars was actually maybe even more Earth-like um, for a lot longer, for a much larger period of time than even Earth itself, because we know that Earth wasn't really that habitable back in the days. So this is something that we didn't really expect to find. And this also is something that suggests that we need to go there and to kind of study these things in person. This also, of course, suggests that maybe just maybe we might be able to discover some signs of at least previous life on Mars. But unfortunately, this particular discovery also kind of raises a few more questions than it actually answers. And one of those questions is, so what is it exactly that we didn't really understand about Mars? We kind of assumed that basically liquid water disappeared uh, within about 800 million years of it, after its creation, but it seems that we were wrong about this. 
So this either means that we totally misunderstood how the atmospheres of these early planets develop, or we misunderstood how planets uh, in the inner solar system evolved in general, or we totally misunderstood how climate and also atmosphere of Mars evolved, and how uh, this particular planet lost its atmosphere or when it lost its atmosphere. So there's definitely a lot of new questions that this particular study created, but the fact that they were able to analyze 200 different riverbeds and they kind of came to a conclusion that some of them existed for several billion years longer and some of them existed for maybe a little bit longer, but many of them had water basically intermittently without any serious periods of dry Mars. So these rivers had water for a very long time and not just in one single spot. This was actually all over Mars. Uh, pretty much every single location on Mars, you can find these riverbeds that had water at some point. That's super interesting, but also kind of unexpected. And like I said, raises more questions. So hopefully in the next few years, we'll be able to actually go to Mars finally and potentially study some of these riverbeds. But for now, all we know is that this picture of these beautiful pebbles that was taken by the Curiosity rover um, on Mars, of course, suggests that this picture or these pebbles could have been created approximately 1 billion years ago. We thought that these were about 4 billion years old, but it turns out that maybe, just maybe, these are relatively young when it comes to actual age of rocks. So this is super exciting and hopefully in the next few years and maybe at least like a decade or so, we'll finally have the answer of when Mars stopped having water and most importantly, if there was actually life that developed here, because that's really the most important question we have right now. So super exciting finding and I honestly think this is probably one of the biggest findings coming from Mars and hopefully someone will follow up on this study and uh, calculate the precise time when Mars actually lost its water. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about a new discovery coming from right here, our neighbor Jupiter. In this video we're going to discuss the potential very large collision that this planet experienced billions of years ago, early in the creation of the solar system. So our story starts right here, around Jupiter. A few years ago, we launched the mission known as Juno that I'm trying to select right here. This is, by the way, using the free software directly from NASA known as Eyes on the Solar System. You can easily find this on NASA's websites. So this right here is the Juno mission. I've talked about uh, the mission itself previously. It's um, probably most famous for using these solar panels really, 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 really far away from the sun. And here we only get about 2% of the efficiency when it comes to solar panels compared to our own planet Earth. But anyway, so as this beautiful probe uh, was orbiting around the most massive planet in the solar system, which is Jupiter, which is somewhere right there far away, um, it started to discover a few things that we couldn't really explain. Now there are a lot of really exciting um, discoveries that have already been very thoroughly analyzed by the mission. Like for example, we already have a very clear picture of the aurora on Jupiter's surface and you can kind of even discover them by using this free application. We also have analyzed the magnetosphere of Jupiter very accurately. You can also see what all of this looks like in um, eyes on solar system. We even have a very accurate representation of the radiation field around Jupiter, as you can see. And lastly, we also have a more detailed picture of the rings that are kind of barely visible because they're really small compared to the rings of Saturn. But the more exciting news coming about Jupiter is actually coming from the inside of the planet. Because by studying the uh, inner core of Jupiter, we started to discover something a little bit un unusual. The core of Jupiter that you see right here doesn't seem to be as solid and as structured as we assumed it to be. It seems to be more dilute and a lot more spread out across the entire volume as if something disturbed it. Now, this wasn't really uh, very clear to us. We couldn't really understand why this is so. And we're actually still not even sure. There are possibly a lot of other explanations. But in this video, we're talking about one of such potential explanations. That's probably also one of the more exciting ones. And you could probably already tell from the title that it's about a collision with a very large planetary object. Basically, a collision with another planet. And although generally scientists today believe that planetary collisions are actually super rare, they only happen like maybe once every few billion years, and um, a chance of having a large collision with Jupiter, according to some of the scientists, is like one in one trillion. It's super, super unlikely. 
Nevertheless, for this particular paper, the scientists estimate that within the first few million years of the existence of the solar system, because of the amount of various planetary objects in the solar system and because of the sheer gravitational attraction of Jupiter, the chance for collision was not so low. It, it was about 40% or basically 40% chance that Jupiter did collide with something. And this is how the scientists behind this paper from Nature magazine try to describe and explain what we're seeing inside the core of Jupiter and why they think it's so diluted and so unusual. They believe that some sort of an object, a very large object, collided with Jupiter pretty much head on and changed the um, core composition and also core structure itself, eventually turning the core into this very large, very diluted structure that we have today, that even after four and a half billion years, still hasn't really solidified into um, a solid structure. In other words, this collision was so dramatic and so huge in proportions that it completely restructured the inside of Jupiter. But this wasn't a simple collision similar to the one that Earth experienced uh, when the moon was created. Here, if, for example, we take an object, like, let's just say, something equivalent to Uranus in size, and then try to launch it at Jupiter, but here under an angle, you'll notice that um, as it collides with Jupiter, which is kind of what most of collisions we think are like, um, it would most likely only affect the outer regions of Jupiter. It would never really make it to the core, and all of the material that's going to be generated here is very likely just going to disturb the outer surface. Let's see what actually happens. I'm kind of curious what will happen in a few hours here. But um, it's not going to affect the core. So we think that this is not the type of a collision that happened here. This collision would not really change the core almost at all. On the other hand, a collision with a planet that's a little bit more similar to Earth or a super Earth. So anywhere from, let's just say, half a mass of Earth to about maybe four or five masses of Earth would not really provide enough effect to affect Jupiter as well. It would most likely, let's see what actually happens again, it would most likely not really pierce through the thick layer of Jupiter, and thus would not really affect the core as much either. So here, after all of this explosion settles, it would probably leave something on the surface here and would uh, maybe go through a couple of thousand kilometers of the atmospheric layer, but it very unlikely would pierce through the atmosphere or ever get to the core at all. And so once again, we believe that a collision with a smaller object would only affect the upper atmosphere of Jupiter, not so much the core. So a very unique type of a collision with a very specific angle and basically a very specific mass would have to have occurred to generate the effects that we observe inside the Jupiter's core. And what do these scientists think happened? And according to them, as Jupiter was orbiting the solar system, and here you can see it flying through the solar system, it received a head-on collision from a planet that was roughly around 10 masses of Earth in mass. So maybe a little bit uh, less massive than Neptune and Uranus, a lot more massive than Earth, and also very similar to um, objects that we usually refer to as sub-Neptunes. So here, if we try to simulate this, this collision is going to happen head-on at a very, very high velocity. We believe that there were many such planets in the um, early solar system. We also believe that these planets uh, were very likely responsible for um, colliding and possibly even producing some other planets like Earth and Mars. But most importantly, today we believe that one such planet still exists. And this is something I'm going to talk about in a few seconds after we see what happened to Jupiter um, when it experienced this collision. So this would very, very likely reshape the core of Jupiter, making it more diluted, but also because it's a head-on collision with such a massive object, it would also cause Jupiter to migrate. It would very likely change the orbital speed of Jupiter, decreasing it, thus making Jupiter move to a different location in its orbit. Now, planetary migration is something we believe happened many, many um, billions of years ago, but this could have been the start of that migration. If something suddenly shifted Jupiter in its orbit, it would then start shifting all other planets, including, for example, uh, Mars and uh, Earth and, of course, Saturn. So all of this could have started with this really, really massive collision that then influenced Jupiter's 
insides and this is what we're observing. Now this is still a hypothesis, it's not a theory and it definitely needs a follow-up study and a lot of other observation and possibly even more proof but for now it does make a lot of sense. There is however another really important idea that all of this proposes. The idea is of having such a very massive planet in the existence of an early solar system which of course gives more credence to the theory of Planet 9. Because it is very likely that some of these planets did collide with Jupiter, but some of them, possibly even from the same uh, planetary body formation region as the one that collided with Jupiter, may have approached Jupiter too close and as a result of this, as a result of a gravitational interaction, got kicked out of this inner solar system and ended up moving all the way to the back of the solar system where it then stabilized and is there today. In other words, this sort of provides a little bit more proof to the existence of Planet 9 and how it could have ended up in the far regions of the solar system. Now, for now, we don't really know if Planet 9 is real. We also don't really know if Jupiter received the collision, but both ideas do kind of come really nicely together, especially if we do discover that Jupiter received the collision or if we discover Planet 9 somewhere out there. For now though, we don't really yet know if any of this is a fact, we just know that it's very, very possible. And this is the brilliance of science. We need to test and double test and people need to try to disprove the theory before it becomes a fact. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about beautiful Titan. And more specifically about this beautiful map that you see on the screen that was recently created by scientists, allowing us to create the most detailed map of Titan to date. So by now you might be already aware that Titan is the only other body in the solar system where we have officially confirmed actual liquid. And more specifically, lakes. This object here has actual lakes. And although Titan is not actually a planet but a moon of Saturn, nevertheless it possesses a lot of properties that could technically make it a planet, or at least a new type of an object. This is sort of what it looks like compared to Saturn and if you were to look into the atmosphere of Titan, which we have done using the Cassini uh, mission and also the Huygens probe that landed on Titan, you would discover something that looks like this. This hazy and very very thick atmosphere that's even thicker than the one here on Earth. Scientists have even speculated that if you were to go to Titan and essentially bring a couple of really small wings that you could attach to your own arms, you could fly there simply because the atmosphere is really thick and the gravity is really low. And this is also one of the most well studied objects in the solar system simply because it's the farthest object we've landed on. Here's a simulation of what the actual collision or landing was like and we do have an actual video that I've discussed uh, previously that shows us what the surface sort of looks like. And interestingly here, these rocks that you see everywhere, they're not really rocks, they're basically just ice uh, chunks or big chunks of water uh, that was frozen for millions and billions of years. And so it's no surprise that um, Titan is a very exciting place. There are a lot of things here that do resemble planet Earth in a lot of ways, even though it's a lot smaller than Earth. And the fact that it has atmosphere and it has actual liquids on the surface, although not water, it's actually things like ethane and methane, all of this together makes this a very exciting world where we are hoping to find the first ever extraterrestrial life. Which is why the release of this paper that came out in Nature magazine made me really really excited because Titan is basically this one place that I would really love to visit one day. The scientists behind this paper essentially were able to combine all of the data that was collected over the years by the Cassini mission and all of this was then combined into this first ever relatively comprehensive map of Titan with actual features examined in a little bit more detail. Now we did have maps of Titan before and as a matter of fact even Google Maps has this image that you see right here that's represented through the collection of all the data we've received from Cassini but it's not really that clear what we're looking at here. We even have a somewhat similar map right here in Universe Sandbox that you can examine and um, some of the features are visible here but the thing is it's still quite impossible to tell what's what. What exactly is a lake? What exactly is a mountain range? And what exactly is a simple plain? So this paper does just that. The entire focus of this is to try to summarize where things are and where I guess important things are. And interestingly, even though it doesn't really look that detailed, it does provide quite a lot of interesting information, along with certain words that I've never really heard of before. 
And this, by the way, just means mountains and hills. So first of all, this right here are the lakes. The lakes are in the north, but they only cover about 1.5% of the entire surface. And that's really insignificant when you compare it to Earth, where the percentage is closer to about 71. So here, there is practically no liquid. But all of the liquid that is here is in the north. Now, you might be wondering why, or you might have already guessed why, it definitely has something to do with the seasons. Because the northern part experiences a lot more summers, or technically longer summers, because of the orbit of Saturn around the Sun. So due to the elliptical nature of Saturn, the northern part here is, I guess, in some sense slightly warmer than the southern part. And this is a very unusual feature that doesn't seem to exist anywhere else in the solar system. Although there is at least one major lake in the south known as Ontario Lacus, named after the province of Ontario, and the origin of which I've discussed in one of the previous videos. So, in that sense, the amount of liquid here is definitely very unusual. At the same time, right here in the um, so-called equatorial area of uh, Titan, there is a lot of really unusual dune-like formation, which doesn't seem to exist on the polar regions. And this is probably due to the rotation of the planet and the way that all of the stuff gets deposited on the surface. There are also these occasional um, areas known as labyrinth, and you can find more of them by going to Google Maps and uh, actually seeing the specific labyrinths that are located on every individual one of them and seeing what they're called and what exactly um, they're named after. But these labyrinths are basically just valleys. Valleys that were formed by rain that essentially carved the ice rock and created these unusual formations. Now on our planet, valleys are usually formed through the interaction with water. Usually rivers carve them or a lot of rain activity as well. And so similar effects are probably causing the valleys on Titan. Which suggests that uh, liquid methane and ethane flows um, occasionally and forms these unusual regions that would be absolutely beautiful to look at one day. But unfortunately, all of the images we have of uh, these features are not really that detailed. So unless we go back there and land an actual probe or a rover, which we are currently planning by the way, we're not unfortunately going to be able to imagine what exactly all of this looks like. Now about 14% of the entire surface is hummocky or basically has hills and mountains, which is quite expected from any object really. And about 17% are these dunes um, which form very likely due to the wind activity on the surface of Titan. And because the Titanian atmosphere is a lot thicker than the one on Earth, it very likely creates a lot more wind activity as well. Although possibly not in terms of the actual speed, but definitely in terms of strength. And so here, I would expect dunes to be pretty much everywhere, which they seem to be. And because they mostly form along the equator, it's also implying that most of the wind activity is along the equator, not so much in the polar regions. And the rest of Titan is basically just plains, which is great news for us because plains are usually the regions where we would like to land different probes. So in terms of landing opportunities, there are quite a lot here. So it's going to be very exciting when we finally launch the next probe to go to Titan. The next probe is actually going to be this. This is the Dragonfly mission and its launch date is currently set for 2026. But you never know, maybe China decides to make it here first and maybe they'll be the first to land on Titan. But unlike previous probes, Dragonfly is going to be a helicopter. And it can totally work here because of the thickness of atmosphere and because of the low um, gravity of the object. Although since using solar panels here will be completely useless, the um, Dragonfly is also going to be equipped with its own RTG or essentially a nuclear reactor. So in a decade or so, it's definitely going to be a really exciting mission to follow. Now, apart from that, there was also another really major discovery. And the discovery is that there are not that many craters. And we technically expect the craters to be everywhere because pretty much most of the objects in the solar system have experienced a lot of different collisions. So the absence of craters suggests only one thing, that the surface of Titan is exceptionally active. There are a lot of things going on here and it's very likely that the surface gets renewed very regularly, suggesting that the craters simply disappear with time. But the biggest discovery in this paper is the diversity. 
the amount of different features and the amount of activity that's present on this object. Except for Earth, there is no other object in the solar system that has so much stuff going on that has an actual active liquid cycle and atmospheric conditions that do mimic to some extent planet Earth. There is no other object in the solar system that presents more opportunities for us to discover actual extraterrestrial life and if we ever discover something here it's very likely not going to be that surprising. We've already witnessed quite a lot of signs suggesting that something unusual is going on here especially when it comes to atmospheric circulation. For example unexplained methane clouds that are still not entirely well understood. Hello wonderful person this is Anton and today we're going to be going back to our own planet and we're going to return to Greenland. Because that's right, NASA, as you can probably tell from the title, discovered yet another crater in the region where they discovered the first crater. But I actually wanted to talk a little bit more about this discovery because people based on the actual uh, title may jump into conclusions that are not actually true. So today we're going to talk science and I'm going to tell you exactly what NASA has discovered and what we know, but most importantly, what we still don't really know about the Greenland craters. So the Greenland crater, uh, the first crater at least, uh, now officially has a name, but uh, not really anything else. We still don't really know the actual dates. We will probably not know the actual uh, collision dates for a very long time. Uh, the name of the crater is actually right here. It's known as the Hawaii Hawaiiathic crater. Um, and um, what we've discovered about it is that, well, we know for a fact that it's a crater now. And we do have certain signs to indicate that it's a relatively young crater, but anywhere from 12,000 to possibly two and a half million years old. But we still don't know and will not know the actual age, which is uh, where we need to stop kind of speculating about what this may have caused on the planet. Um, the reason we don't know the age is because we need to drill through all of this ice, which is about a kilometer of ice, to try to get a sample of the actual rock underneath. That's kind of hard. It's very hard. It's super challenging. But uh, the person responsible or partially responsible for the discovery of this crater, this wonderful person who, as you can see, has a Twitter account, Joe McGregor, he actually had a hunch and it was a very brilliant hunch. He thought that, well, listen, if we found one crater under the ice, could there be more? And he actually started looking at the data uh, produced by NASA and specifically by both the satellite images and also the images or the X-ray images produced by these NASA airplanes from the Operation Ice Bridge. They're uh, really, really complex um, radar planes, basically. They essentially uh, scan the area below and try to identify what lies underneath the ice. Here's actually one of the more beautiful pictures I was able to find from this mission that someone shot while flying in Greenland. Now. Joe's assumptions about having more craters in Greenland are definitely not far-fetched. If you look at the moon, for example, which is literally the reflection of Earth in a sense, the surface of the moon is covered in craters. It's crater central. If you were to actually count the craters, which someone did for um, their PhD actually, and I don't think that was the most fun PhD to do. But anyway, if you were to count at least size-wise, there are actually over 11,000 craters that are similar in size to the uh, crater we discovered in Greenland a few months ago, um, which was, I think, about 19 miles in diameter, which is approximately 30 kilometers or so. This new crater that Joe discovered pretty much single-handedly in a sense, um, well, actually, not really, but he did kind of play a huge role in it, uh, is a little bit larger. There it is. There is a second possible impact. And um, what we know about it so far is that, well, for one, it seems to be much older. As a matter of fact, one of the first sort of observations about this crater is that the ice above it is uh, approximately 79,000 years old. So this already puts the crater at that lowest age of at least 79,000 years old. As you can see, it's also the sec uh, 22nd largest crater on Earth. And uh, it's approximately 35 kilometers or 22 miles in diameter, so it's a little bit larger. And like I said, the moon has at least 11,000 uh, of similar craters. So on Earth, it's not unusual to find these. I am fairly certain if we look close enough underneath Antarctica and possibly other ice shelves, we're going to find a lot more. 
Now, even though it may not really look like a crater from this angle, um, upon further examinations, which has been done very thoroughly in the paper that you can find right here by uh, Joseph McGregor and the team, um, it basically does kind of tell you exactly why they believe this is a crater. And one of the sort of more obvious features here is the circular shape and the bowl formation that usually only sort of corresponds to a crater or potentially a volcanic eruption. So this could either be a crater or a volcanic eruption, but volcanic eruptions usually are also set associated with very positive magnetic anomalies and also um, normally in the very specific areas around the planet. There are no nearby volcanoes. This is actually really, really far from any nearby volcanoes and there is no uh, magnetic activity here. As a matter of fact, uh, the area where this crater is located seems to have a negative um, gravitational anomaly, specifically right here. And this anomaly indicates that this is basically most likely um, an actual crater. All of the negative anomalies, negative gravitational anomalies, are usually associated with craters because they literally kind of squeeze the ground underneath and they kind of very slightly decrease the gravity. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, if you actually jump here, you're going to be jumping higher. It just means that if you were to measure this very accurately, there will be a very, 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 very tiny decimal point that would be kind of lower than everywhere else on Earth. So there's definitely a lot of signs pointing at this being a crater. Now, in terms of the age, going back to the age, at least 79,000, but the upper end, because of the amount of... Um, erosion that uh, very likely occurred over thousands and thousands of years. The upper end here is actually 100 million years. So this crater could be anywhere from 100,000 to 100 million years old, which is a huge range when you think about it. And we're not going to find out anytime soon because the actual ice here is two kilometers thick. It's even thicker than the first crater we discovered. We definitely know that there is a crater, but we don't really know how old it is. Now here is sort of the obvious question. Is this from the same sort of collision? Are these two craters related? And the answer to this is an almost obvious no, for several reasons, one of them being the age difference, and the second being is that we've actually found these so-called pairings in other locations. There's actually at least one in Canada, there's at least one in Ukraine, so finding a pair of um, craters like this is not uncommon. It does seem kind of unusual, but a lot of things in life are like that. So. It's obvious that these are two completely different collisions that occurred in the same region or similar region, but at a completely different time frame, possibly millions of years apart. And well, unfortunately, that's kind of all we know for now. You can definitely check out the paper that I mentioned, which is right here, and it's also in the description below. Or if you want to find out more from the source directly, uh, you could potentially maybe tweet to Joe directly, although if this video goes viral and everyone starts tweeting him, um, I think he's going to really hate me for that. Sorry. But you know, this is an awesome research and I really want you guys to succeed in what you're doing. So maybe you do need the attention. Anyway, so um, definitely really exciting research. Absolutely amazing uh, work in terms of finding the actual asteroid and identifying the actual uh, location simply using uh, maps that we already had. And I'm sure in the future we're possibly going to find more uh, simply based on the idea that we now know what to look for. This is actually the second ever under the ice crater that was discovered on our planet. And because there is so much ice on our planet, at least for now, until the whole global warming kicks in and melts it, um, we might actually be looking at finding more even this year. Hello, wonderful person. This is Anton. And in this video, we're going to be talking about one of the most unusual planets in our solar system that you see right there behind me. This is Uranus, and some people think that it's a relatively boring planet. On the other hand, some people, or some scientists specifically, think that this is actually one of the most unique, most fascinating, and most unusual planets in our solar system. And there are definitely quite a lot of reasons for why they think so. So for one, even though it seems kind of featureless and doesn't seem to have much happening on the surface, this is because it's actually only invisible light. If you were to look at it in the infrared, you would actually see something completely different. Specifically, you would see something like this. You would see a very unusual looking planet with a very sort of minor but still visible ring around it. 
But that's not really what we're talking about today. What we are going to be talking about is why this unusual planet also has a very unique way of spinning around um, compared to other planets in our solar system. In other words, why is it that Uranus has such an unusual rotation around its orbit? Because actually, if you were to compare it to other planets, it seems to be rotating completely on the side. Now, we briefly actually talked about this phenomenon in one of the previous videos from many years ago, but today we're going to talk about a new study that actually used a very realistic and very accurate simulation to actually finally answer this question once and for all. So let's talk about why Uranus seems to be spinning on the side. Now, first of all, what we know about Uranus is actually um, already quite extreme. For one, we know that its magnetic field doesn't seem to correspond to its rotation um, almost at all. The magnetic field right here is about 59 degrees away from the uh, spin of rotation. And that already shows us that this is actually a really, really strange planet. On the other hand, we also know that um, its composition on the inside is quite different. And it actually seems to even have what's known as diamond rain, essentially diamond-like particles raining down in the atmosphere. On the other hand, it's the only planet that doesn't seem to actually generate any heat on the inside and uh, is basically the coldest planet there is. But all of this for the longest time suggested that um, this may have been because of a very major collision that happened something like two to three billion years uh, from today. And the simulation that I'm going to show you um, investigated this by using what's known as smooth particle hydrodynamic simulation developed back in the 70s to study various astrophysical problems. And it's often actually used um, in various fields, including ballistics, volcanology and oceanography. And a lot of these findings are from a scientist by the name of Jacob Kajeris uh, from Durham University. Essentially, what they did for this study is run close to 50 simulations using a supercomputer until they found this one that seems to have corresponded to um, a major collision from an object that was about two to three masses of Earth that created this. And that, in, in a sense, uh, caused the uh, actual rotation of Uranus to flip by about 97 degrees, which actually is what we have in real life as well. And interestingly, if you actually look at the time here, it only took a few hours for uh, Uranus to basically completely stabilize its orbit and to shift uh, in almost entirely by this amount. So here, within about 62 hours, it's back to being stable, um, very planetary, and even have its moons shifted by about 98 degrees. In other words, if we try to recreate this in Universe Sandbox, and if we actually look at Uranus right here, with obviously its moons added as well, um, you'll notice that the moons are also orbiting at the same sort of inclination. And um, all of this can be explained by a relatively major collision with a planet that was about two times mass of Earth. Now, it didn't seem to actually collide where the mass would be added to the total mass of Uranus. As you can see, the vast majority of the planetary mass actually gets expelled. And this suggests that the original mass of Uranus hasn't really changed that much. And so here we can maybe try to recreate this by colliding an object similar to two masses of Earth and actually seeing what would happen uh, to Uranus in, in our simulation if we did the same as what may have happened in real life. So here's a two masses of Earth, Earth, and it's going to pass uh, relatively close to Uranus. And we're going to see if it actually shifts it even more in terms of the actual um, obliquity, which is the value um, that we're trying to measure here. Obliquity refers to the difference between the actual rotation angle and the actual orbital plane. And so um, this is maybe what have happened here. Here's our Earth approaching Uranus. And let's see if it actually changes the obliquity again. Now, I try to kind of put it in a position where it might just briefly, okay, it wasn't really brief. It wasn't supposed to completely collide with Uranus. It was supposed to just briefly pass, just like it did in the simulation. But as you can see here, it did change the orbit and also the obliquity quite dramatically. Although not actually by as much as uh, it did originally. Here it changed by about, um, I think, 12 degrees 
but it also changed the orbit. So if we now look at the orbit of new Uranus, its orbit actually shifted even beyond the orbit of Neptune. So these collisions um, most likely happened quite a lot in the days of um, early solar system. Uh, and during the so-called late heavy bombardment, we think that pretty much every planet has some sort of a collision. We know that Earth actually may have received a collision which created our moon. We know that Mars received a collision kind of flattening the northern parts. Uh, Venus received a collision, uh, changing its rotation as well, and Mercury seems to have received a collision as well, uh, and also Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune. Uh, we don't really know how it influenced all of these planets, but for Uranus, we have now simulated it using the top-of-the-line su supercomputers, and we think that basically this is kind of how it happened, and this is what led to Uranus becoming such an unusual planet with such an unusual uh, orbital spin, but also uh, with unusual features such as being the coldest planet, the planet with no heat on the inside, and of course the planet with one of the strangest magnetic fields as well, specifically a very tilted magnetosphere with a very unusual shape. Now, all of this suggests to us that we need to actually send a mission here, because there's probably going to be a lot of really interesting things we're going to discover. The only mission we've ever actually had that passed by here was back in 1986, when I was basically still a toddler, uh, the um, Voyager 2 mission actually did visit and took those photos, and every other photo since was actually by a telescope, either by Hubble or Keck telescope or a few other telescopes that have actually taken a very um, unique but also not super accurate pictures. So we do need to have a mission here to actually try to discover what else we can find around this unusual um, ice giant. Uranus is definitely mysterious, and there's definitely a lot of things we're going to be discovering here in the next few decades. On that note, I wanted to actually finish this here, so now hopefully you know a little bit more about Uranus and its unusual tilt, and how it's acquired it over the past 3 billion years. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in this video we're going to be talking about something unusual that was recently observed by amateur astronomers when looking at Jupiter. It's something that happens quite a lot, but nevertheless surprises us every time. And let's begin by looking at what was actually seen. So this is from Ethan Chappelle on Twitter, and you'll see it in a few seconds, right here. There's a little white spot that suddenly occurs on the surface of Jupiter. Now, can you guess what this is? You probably can. It was basically a collision with Jupiter that was observable and visible from really far away. Here's a slightly easier way of seeing this. This is the image created by Ethan Chappelle himself. So um, what we've observed is actually not very uncommon, even though it is quite impressive and quite interesting. But before I tell you what may have collided with Jupiter, let's talk about some of the more famous examples of collisions with this beautiful planet. And it just so happens that we even have this simulated in Universe Sandbox. It's a pre-made simulation that shows us what happened back in 1994. You may see the date on the bottom there. So um, this is something that was super exciting back in 94 because a lot of scientists uh, were observing Jupiter at that time and making a lot of really interesting predictions. You might remember what happened if you were um, around back then, and if you don't, well, basically it was a collision with a comet that broke apart and it had several pieces that collided over several days. This was the comet discovered in 92, known as Shoemaker Levi, named after the discoverers. And as you can see in this actual photo, it was basically like a little train of cometary pieces, anywhere from a few hundred meters up to about almost two kilometers in size. Now, even though it technically doesn't sound like a really large comet, it ended up producing some really spectacular things on the surface of Jupiter. And even though the scientists tried to predict what's going to happen to Jupiter, they really didn't know. So there was a lot of really interesting observations conducted here. And here is one uh, done in infrared. You'll see that the explosions uh, that happened on the surface were actually really powerful and created a lot and a lot of heat. And this heat was so strong that it was visible for several weeks afterwards. The temperatures here were close to about 24,000 degrees Celsius which is basically a pretty hot environment. And considering that these fragments, despite their small size, were able to produce formations that were basically size of planet Earth or even larger than that, it does kind of make you wonder what would happen if these collided with our planet. 
So this is actually a kind of a realistic representation of what happened on Jupiter. The actual um, fireball that was produced, that was really, really hot, created these beautiful waves that propagated across the surface of Jupiter at a speed of about 500 meters per second. And it, you could actually even see them move across Jupiter in several different spots. And what's really interesting about each of these collisions is that they all left these very interesting dark spots on the surface that were composed of different materials from those comets or from, from the cometary pieces. And they actually stayed on Jupiter for several months. You could easily observe them with um, a relatively small telescope and uh, these were even more easily visible than the great red spot of Jupiter. So each of these spots that was created, which we're going to do right now as well, stayed there for a long time, was very visible, and generated a lot of energy. Now, remember, the original comet we think was only about maybe two kilometers in size. Just to give you an idea, here's what the Halley's Comet, one of the more famous comets, looks like. This is at least double the size of that smaller comet that collided with Jupiter. So um, an object that's only this big generated a tremendous amount of energy and very visible effects on a huge planet like Jupiter. So let's just maybe finish these collisions. You'll see how each of these uh, cometary collisions will leave a very interesting mark on the surface. And so um, all of this left Jupiter with roughly around 21 different marks on the surface. In total, it was something like 6 million megatons of energy that was released, which is roughly around 120,000 times less than the super famous Tsar Bomb, the biggest nuclear weapon ever detonated. So this is kind of what Jupiter had for a while, and um, after a few months, everything went back to normal and these spots disappeared. But the interesting thing is that um, these spots were formed by the material from those comets, so we could actually study what's inside of them and discover the composition of these comets. And that's because the um, comets never really reached the lower levels of Jupiter. All of them sort of disintegrated and exploded much before they reached even the water level of Jupiter. All of this happened at a really high velocity of roughly around 60 kilometers per second. And because of this, the entire um, comet basically just exploded in the upper atmosphere before it reached even two atmospheres of pressure. By the time it reached three atmospheres of pressure, it was basically already kind of gone. And so this is something that's pretty common in Jupiter. Today we believe that roughly around 2,000 to maybe even 8,000 more collisions happen on Jupiter than they do on Earth. And that's really important because it makes Jupiter, I guess you can call it a vacuum cleaner. It's literally the solar system is a vacuum cleaner that sort of collects all of these comets and all of these asteroids that would come to Earth otherwise and has them collide here instead of colliding with our planet. Many scientists today believe that because of Jupiter, the complex life was able to evolve on planet Earth and that without this beautiful giant, we would probably never have a chance to evolve to the point where we are today. But that's not really what this video is about today. Today, I wanted to briefly talk about what was observed by Ethan Chappelle right here. So we know that this was a pretty powerful explosion as well. As a matter of fact, it's almost the size of Earth. It's a huge explosion. It's several thousand kilometers across. But as you can see, it only lasted for maybe two seconds, three seconds maximum, and then sort of disappeared. The only reason um, Ethan Chappelle was even able to see it is because he had some sort of a software running that was meant to detect these flashes and explosions. And so this here is actually something that happens quite often and is um, caused not by a large comet like you just saw, with Shoemaker Levi, but something much, much smaller. As a matter of fact, we think that this rock here was probably only about 10 meters across. And that's really mind blowing. It's a much smaller mass, it's a much smaller rock, but it's able to produce an actual flesh pretty much comparable to the flashes we saw with Shoemaker Levi. And that's of course because these are uh, the explosions that happen initially when a super fast object reaches the upper atmosphere and generates a tremendous amount of energy that generates an explosion. It's an, what we call an air bolide. 
And today we're pretty certain that a very similar impact occurred back in 2010 and another one in 2012 because we saw a very similar flash to this and it only lasted for two seconds and one major difference between this flash and the ones from Shoemaker Levi is that after we looked at it again the surface of Jupiter did not have these very distinct patterns that were formed by the material from the comet or from the asteroid. This was seen back in 2009 though, when an object that was roughly around 500 meters collided and left this mark that you see here. So a larger asteroid would produce this, but a smaller um, rock that's only about 10 to 20 meters would just explode in the upper atmosphere and would most likely leave no mark. And so this is how we can distinguish what collided with Jupiter. But these smaller collisions happen very, very often. As a matter of fact, um, we've always tried to kind of understand how exactly the moons of Jupiter, like for example Ganymede, got these unusual formations. Now you can imagine how they actually formed. This was created by another similar object, possibly a comet, that approached Jupiter and when it came too close to the planet, because of the tidal forces and the gravitational stretching, it fell apart and created this kind of a line that you see here formed by the uh, fragments of the comet or the asteroid. And eventually, just like back in 1994, this whole um, train of comets or asteroids collided with Ganymede, collided with Callisto and other moons of Jupiter to form these unusual patterns that we can now explain pretty easily. So this is just another example of how often these collisions on Jupiter do occur. Although we think that the bigger ones, like uh, shoemaker Levi, only happen maybe every few thousand years, these smaller collisions happen pretty regularly, with small rocks like one we just witnessed happening possibly every year, several times a year. And because so many astronomers have been looking at Jupiter to try to find more of these flashes, we've been able to discover quite a lot of them in the last uh, few years. But I guess the most important takeaway here is that Jupiter is exceptionally important for protection of life here on Earth and these collisions happen so frequently that without this beautiful planet we would have probably been gone long time ago. It literally sucks in everything from the outer solar system, it's able to influence many different asteroids and comets and sort of bring them closer to itself and those comets then fall into the planet here instead of falling on a much more fragile planet Earth, just like you're about to see right here. Now, the collision with a comet right now would have probably have such a devastating effect that it would literally wipe out pretty much all of the major complex life on the planet, just like another comet did 65 million years ago when it collided with our planet right here and caused the destruction of pretty much all major dinosaur species on the planet. So comets do cause major trouble for us and we need to make sure we're able to somehow divert them if they decide to come too close to our planet. For now though, Jupiter is definitely our best protector and our best chance at surviving. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about our own moon and the recent discovery that may be able to finally explain why our moon has two different faces. It has two different sides that are actually somewhat different. So this research comes to us from the Macau University of Science and Technology in China and it's a research that also connects to what's happening on the moon, on the far side of the moon, where China currently has um, an explorer known as Chang'e 4 that for the past few months has been exploring and uh, trying to investigate various rocks on the moon. Now what it discovered is that, well, as we suspected, the moon has experienced a very large impact in its history because it discovered these rocks that are known as magma rocks that came from within the moon and the only explanation here is that well it's probably something that collided into the moon and then released these rocks from within the moon uh, landing them on the surface and that's kind of what we've discovered. But what exactly was it that collided with the moon and this is what this research tries to answer. But before we answer this question, let's take a look at the moon's surface here and compare the two sides. So this is the side that we see, this is known as the near side of the moon. Um, and as you can see, it has a lot of uh, unusual dark patches and also, uh, by the way, these are called maria, and um, also a lot of um, areas that don't have a lot of impact here. 
This is because once upon a time, this was all molten lava. Then you look at the other side and it's all filled with craters, a lot of craters. And it looks almost entirely like a completely different object altogether. There's also a very large crater right here. And so, uh, because of all of this, we've always assumed that something must have collided with the moon and changed its surface. And the other really interesting thing about the moon is that back in 2012, NASA had a really interesting mission known as GRAIL that studied the unusual gravitational anomalies on the surface of the moon to basically try to explain why is it that the moon's um, actual gravitational shape or technically speaking, the actual gravity well, is very bumpy. It's not really uh, spherical as on Earth. In other words, if you were to try to assume an orbit around the moon, um, a circular orbit, eventually you would slowly lose the orbit and fall onto the surfaces of the moon. That's because there are a lot of bumps in the gravitational well. It would be a good video for another day, but you can also check out Scott Manley's video that he recently made that explains this really well. And so what these missions discovered is that the far side right here has um, almost like a several kilometer thick extra layer of rocks that um, most likely came from this side right here. And all of this together kind of adds up to a very interesting story that um, may explain what really happened to the moon. And the simulations from the Macau University also add to the story explaining exactly what may have occurred. So having run 360 simulations, they discovered that there's only maybe one or two that fit the scenario really well and created the moon that we see in our night skies. What they discovered is that if an object very similar in size to Ceres, which is uh, the dwarf planet in the um, asteroid belt, slightly smaller than Ceres actually, probably around 780 kilometers in diameter, moving at a speed of about 6,200 um, meters per second, or about six kilometers per second, toward the moon, toward the uh, near side of the moon, collided with it, it would create the effects that we're observing on the surface. So here we're going to try to simulate this. Um, we're going to essentially recreate this collision. And um, what this resulted in was literally a tremendously large explosion with almost like a tsunami of rocks that traveled across the moon. And for the most part, um, let's let's see if we can actually create this here. Um, this shock wave will deposit all of these rocks on the other side of the moon. So this is the best explanation we have so far. So this is probably what happened um, with the surface here. It's a little bit slow because the co my computer is trying to process all of this information. But here you can see all of these rocks will now start uh, traveling across the moon and will hopefully get deposited on the other side. Now, it's possible that we're not going to get exactly this effect, but when they ran the simulation, um, like I said, over 300 times, the result was practically identical to the real moon. Now, um, a lot of these rocks that we have might not get deposited there, but we're going to accelerate time just to see if it happens. And the other um, thing that this actually explains is why certain rocks on the moon have a slightly different composition of isotopes, specifically potassium, phosphorus, and a few other rare um, earth elements that are different from earth. The only explanation here would be if the moon actually received a collision from something else that brought those isotopes and this would be explained by this collision. All right, so I wasn't really able to um, deposit these on the other side but they might still come back and land on the opposite side here. Let's see if this happens. I, I see some of them coming closer and closer. And there we go. Okay, it's just a few. So we're going to accelerate this just to see what happens. But basically, this is how they explain how the surface of the moon is so different and what happened to the far side of the moon after the collision. And uh, some of the previous assumptions were that, well, maybe our moon has a different side because um, early in the creation of the solar system, when the moon was just made, there were two moons that Earth had, and they both kind of slowly combined into one. And um, it's a good assumption, but the thing is, it doesn't explain the differences in um, compositions of potassium isotopes, for example. It also doesn't really explain why there are magma rocks detected on the other side of the moon by the Chang'e 4 mission. And so uh, a lot of this can definitely be explained by this collision with uh, a dwarf planet like or a series like object um, that collided with the near side of the moon. 
And as you can see here, well, this is actually a relatively accurate recreation of this collision. So a lot of the rocks here did land on the opposite side and created even more craters now. Although, as I just realized, it also pushed the moon way, way, way farther away from Earth. And so now it's no longer in orbit around Earth. And that's actually maybe a little bit of a problem because um, a collision, a straight collision with the moon would probably dislodge it entirely. So it's actually quite possible that the collision was maybe under a slight angle like this. Um, and this would possibly prevent the moon from losing the orbit around the planet Earth. So let's see if this particular collision dislodged the moon around Earth. And we're going to accelerate times here just to see where exactly the moon is going to end up. And it looks like it's still in orbit. So it was most likely not a direct face on collision. It's quite possible that the actual collision was under an angle. So in that sense, um, it's quite an interesting research. It's definitely going to help us explain what is happening on the surface of the moon and how it's different from um, planet Earth. And because we're definitely going back to the moon, at least according to NASA, by 2024, and the Artemis mission will most likely um, actually help us settle on the moon finally, this is important for us to understand because potentially we might be able to discover some unusual or rare Earths and rare elements on the moon that were delivered by this collision that don't exist on Earth. And if we discover unusual elements that might have price, this will kick off a new era of exploration because everyone is going to try to make it into commercial endeavor. And where there's money, there's always new opportunities. Because, I mean, when you think about it, most of the colonization on our planet Earth occurred because of money. It kind of drives the economy, right? It kind of drives people to explore and to create new endeavors and to create new things in less hospitable um, situations. So if we discover something really cool here, it's probably going to start a new era of human civilization. But for now, that's really all we know about the moon. We now think that this large collision brought a lot of elements and created these two sides that are different. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about a discovery of mini-moons around our planet. Actually, we've already known about mini-moons, but now we've seen at least one of them crash into our planet. So before I tell you a little bit more about what mini-moons are, let me take you back approximately 106, I think, years from today. On February 9th of 1913, this is what you would see if you were to look into the night skies. Actually, they only lasted for like three minutes and to some extent may have resembled what you would see today when Elon Musk launches his satellite, the so-called satellite train, but what they saw in 1913 is today referred to as the 1913 Great Meteor Procession. Now this is not a photograph, this is just a picture that was drawn by a, a painter in Toronto, but in a nutshell what this was was basically dozens or possibly even hundreds of fragments that moved across the skies in a relatively perfect formation, not that different from what you see here, this is from SpaceX obviously. They also generated a huge amount of noise while moving across the skies and at the same time were visible in many parts of North America, including even places like Bermuda. And so in that sense, many parts of North America observed this event and documented it both the visuals and the actual auditory experience. And this uh, image from Texas State University shows where they actually traveled and what parts of the world could have seen them back in 1913. But what exactly were these and how does it relate to what we're talking about today? Well, as you can probably guess from the title, these were mini-moons. And we know that because of the way that they traveled and because of the orbits which were concentric or merely concentric with the surface of our planet and also because of the low velocity, today we're almost certain that these were so-called mini-moons. Or in some sense you can also call them temporary moons of our planet. So if we were to take a look at our planet Earth and to somehow visualize various objects in orbit around our planet, ignoring the satellites that were launched by us, we would find quite a lot of stuff that is sort of invisible to us. So here in Universe Sandbox, I'm going to try to demonstrate to you the um, more or less simplified version of this. But if we were to enable orbits, we would find ourselves surrounded by various tiny rocks that were captured by our planet's gravity and settled in these temporary orbits around Earth. 
once in a while because of the um, interaction with the moon which you can kind of see already is happening with one of these objects their orbital parameters will change and some of them might come close to our planet and in case of 1913 meteors a lot of them ended up flying through the atmosphere and possibly entered the atmosphere and then fell to our planet somewhere past this area right here um, east of Brazil. Now Australia has this really interesting network known as the Fireballs in the Sky. This is on the website called fireballsinthesky.com.au and essentially it's to report various um, observations or detections of fireballs or meteors or in some cases meteorites. And it just so happens that the network detected at least one fireball not so long ago with the designation right here that seems to correspond to what may have been or very likely have been an actual mini moon that then collided with our planet. Now the observations suggest that it was a very very small piece, possibly only a few centimeters across, but um, its orbit and its speed of entrance and of course its angle of approach toward the atmosphere of our planet suggests that it was actually orbiting our planet for a little bit before colliding with it. And the previous such identification with very accurate results was actually only in 2006. There was another mini moon known as 2006 RH120 whose orbit we were able to analyze quite thoroughly for many years and we even know exactly where it is right now. So you can see here in between 2006 and 2007 it was um, in a somewhat hectic orbit around Earth then got disrupted by the moon and is now doing something like this around our planet. So these mini moons are pretty much all over the place there, but they're obviously very difficult to find. And in most cases, it's a little bit easier for us to find them when they actually do crash into our planet. Now, because they're all very, very, very small, none of them pose any danger to our planet, but they are exceptionally interesting to us for scientific reasons. Because all of these mini moons orbit around our planet and are essentially in similar orbits to a satellite that we would launch for, for example, GPS satellite, a lot of these objects would be very interesting for us to go and try to, um, well, actually collect. It would be very interesting to launch a mission to one of these mini moons and try to recover as much material as possible or possibly just grab the whole thing if it's really small. Not only is this interesting from a scientific perspective of basically studying the early solar system, it also has a very practical reason. We could use these mini moons as a kind of a test bed for future mining platforms. So basically by creating a kind of a prototype for mining, um, let's just say autonomous robotic platform, we could then send it here and then use this platform to experiment with various methods of, let's just say, extracting materials. Now this mini moon turns out to be a little bit larger than I wanted it to be. None of the mini moons are actually that big, but this is a good example from a visual perspective of what it might be like later on when we do actually try to mine asteroids, when we try to create mining facilities on asteroids somewhere out there. And some scientists even suggested that we could technically take um, an actual asteroid, especially if it's not too big, and then uh, change its orbital parameters to turn it into a mini moon of our planet. Now here the only reason would be commercial. If an asteroid has a lot of potential benefits to us, like for example metals and various um, rare earths that we can't really find easily on the planet, then we could relocate the asteroid and turn it into an artificial moon of planet Earth. This is maybe what it will be like in coming decades as soon as we figure out how to mine these objects. Now, interestingly, over the years, these studies have also learned that um, our planet Earth has a tendency to capture most of these mini moons, usually during its perihelion or aphelion. In more layman terms, the closest or the farthest distance from the Sun. This here would be January and this here would be June. So in other words, most of these moons would probably be captured either in January or in June. And so this is a good opportunity for us to do the mini moon research. Now, many of these mini moons are only temporarily. So um, at some point they will actually escape our planet's orbit or some of them might actually crash into it, but they're small, so it's not really a big deal. But it's also very likely that because our observational techniques have improved so much, we're going to be able to detect even more of them over time um, and even before they collide with our planet. And by the way, the only reason we know that this here was a mini moon is of course because of its low velocity. The velocity here was only about 11 kilometers per second, equivalent to a typical satellite of um, our planet when it crashes into it at the end of its life. 
However, a typical shooting star or a meteor you would see in the skies would have velocities at least 3 or maybe even 7 times higher than what we've just observed. So in that sense, these are slightly different objects. They're also really important to study because some of them might come from objects that are much larger and they may have separated from a larger asteroid and if that larger asteroid decides to come to our planet, that would maybe not be that good for us. So we do need to study these objects in a little bit more detail just to understand their origin and where they actually came from. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about our beautiful planet Earth and well actually some kind of interesting and somewhat good news coming from locations that we never really hear good news from. We're talking about two countries that are known for pollution, but these two countries, India and China, have really surprised NASA scientists. And I wanted to start right here over Brazil because even though it does look pretty green as you can see, um, it isn't really that green anymore. As a matter of fact, Brazil has lost a tremendous amount of its rainforest and now um, is a lot more, I guess you can call it brown, um, than it used to be. And this so-called browning effect is um, caused by, well, the human activity, of course. We tend to cause deforestation quite a lot nowadays and these deforestation effects that you can clearly see in this animation right here are obviously the effects from human activity, usually um, us trying to develop new urban areas and um, well, use all kinds of wood for all kinds of materials. And so very recently I was looking at various data sets from NASA and this is actually a really interesting one. This one shows you various levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of our planet, starting with way below 400 ppmv, um, and when it reaches the red stage, um, basically closer to today, you'll see that it's going to be closer to about 410 ppmv. So I was looking at these sets and I also discovered this really unusual paper that mentioned China in India. This is actually a paper from Nature magazine, so it was definitely something I needed to check out. And what this paper describes is that NASA has also very recently discovered that there's an unusual increase in the so-called greening effect. In other words, there is a sudden increase of green uh, forests around the world. And they couldn't really figure out why. And at first they thought, well, maybe it's because of global warming. Uh, because there is a lot more uh, moisture and wetness around the world, and because there's a lot more space in the northern uh, parts where ice used to exist and now there's just basically land, maybe that's where the actual green started to happen. So kind of like, I guess, the northern parts of Russia, northern parts of Canada and so on. And it's also possibly because of the increase in CO2 that suddenly there was a lot more green stuff to consume that CO2. But turns out they were actually wrong and that's not at all what happened. And they started looking at the data and discovered a lot of this so-called green effect was appearing only in, well, really two regions of the planet. And specifically these two regions were politically defined. There were basically two countries. First being China, right here, and second being India, right here. And then uh, third obviously being the entire EU. And that was extremely strange because, I mean, China does kind of produce a lot of industrial pollution and India does have some of the most hazardous cities to live in in the world. But at the same time, it seems that these two countries, well, they actually decided to act on it. And at least in the last two decades, they've dramatically increased the reforestation activities around the country. As a matter of fact, India currently holds the record for um, planting something like 50 million trees in a single day. And that is mind blowing. They've literally turned reforestation into a kind of a, well, I guess you can call it a competitive activity with other countries. But I guess what's even more unusual is that China seems to have even more of such activities, at least in the last um, decade or so. In other words, the two countries that we normally blame for most of the negative effects on the climate have actually, well, improved it by a lot. As a matter of fact, the reforestation effects are so dramatic that the change for the so-called greening due to human activity for China alone is approximately 10%. In other words, the actual amount of forest in China has increased by about 10%, which is mind-blowing. But also not really surprising because both of these countries have now um, officially admitted and sort of accepted the fact that pollution is happening everywhere and they need to take care of it. And so both of these countries have actively started to pursue alternative means. Like for example, today in Beijing, you will not find a single motorcycle 
or any kind of a scooter activity that's often um, responsible for making the air dirty. Now, this is not true for the entire China, but in some of the major cities, they have now started to actively set a lot of regulations to uh, decrease pollution dramatically. And actually, Canada is here on the list because, well, back home in Canada, a lot of people often uh, use tree planting as a kind of a college job. I did this myself, actually. I believe I planted several thousand trees, although maybe the number was a little bit smaller. I don't really remember. It's been a while, but it is kind of part of the culture. So as we realize eventually, hopefully, that our world is not actually getting any better, we need to maybe start um, educating people around us to take care of it a little bit more. And I know that um, normally you don't really hear very often that we should be following China's footsteps in something, especially with the whole trade war going on and a lot of negative press is getting. But it seems that they have this one thing figured out. The greening effect has increased so much and has improved our planet so much that um, we need to maybe join them in whatever it is that they're doing. And I honestly would like to find out more about this. But unfortunately, even though I've asked a lot of my Chinese friends to tell me more about what they think is happening, it seems that um, it's sort of a mystery. Now, I'm going to dig deeper and try to find what exactly caused this 10% uh, increase in the last decade, because that's honestly really remarkable. This is something that I totally did not expect to hear coming out of a country like China. But most importantly, I would really like to find out if this is something that can be replicated in other countries and if it's something that we should maybe implement in our society as a whole. And although in case of India, it seems that most of this greening effect actually came from um, plantations of crops and essentially food, with only about 5% being forests, in China, that percentage is 44 in other words, um, almost half of all of greening effect was caused by replanting forests around the country. And that is something I really want to find out more about because unfortunately in this paper, there was just not enough information. And so once I find out more about what exactly China did and how they were able to replant so many forests so quickly, we'll talk more about this in one of the future videos. But for now, I guess we'll keep it a bit of a mystery and also potentially a kind of a hope for the future of humanity. Because forests are important to us, greenery is important, and making the planet more green is even more important. And there's a super important lesson in all of this, and the lesson is that, well, I guess we can't really judge the book by its cover. We do have to look at the data, and specifically here, the data from NASA, that showed us that the two countries that increase the actual greenery around the world the most are the ones we always blamed for the pollution. So this is super important. Don't always listen to the media and also don't really judge someone or something based on something that they used to do. A lot of countries and a lot of people around the world do change with time. And it seems that both India and China realized that it was about time that they actually changed their countries. So maybe your country will also do the same one day. And let's just hope that other countries, like for example Brazil that you see on the screen right here, follow suit. And so instead of deforestation that you're observing, maybe they'll reverse this process and turn this into a forest once again. Hello, wonderful person. This is Anton. And in this video, we're going to be talking about the climate change, probably the most controversial topic and the most divisive topic I could have picked because, you know, why not? Anyway, so this is actually based on a very recent paper published in the Nature magazine that talks about a very interesting sort of, a, I guess you can call it a discovery, but more of a summary. And specifically what this particular paper does is it doesn't just talk about um, a single region uh, where maybe ice has disappeared or it doesn't really talk about some other regions where ice may have actually increased in size. It essentially combines the data from various universities, from various studies, and puts it all in one single map to discover what's really happening to the ice shelves and the other reserves of ice on our planet to see what's maybe happening to it. Now, you can probably guess what we've discovered though. And honestly, um, whether you believe that global warming is a thing or if you think it's a conspiracy, the science behind this shows the following. Let me just show you the picture. This is the summary from their study. 
every single circle you see, or every single sphere, I guess, because it's technically three-dimensional, shows you how much ice each region lost in billions of tons, gigatons. There is, however, at least one region, specifically this right here, uh, close to India, that has gained uh, some ice. Now, we don't really know why some regions lost ice and why some regions gained ice, but we do have the global average right here. And this is a global average from the last 50-ish years, actually over 50, since 1961. This is all based on both direct observations and different types of measurements from pretty much every individual region combined into one. And the summary is that we lost basically 9.6 trillion tons of ice. Okay, so what exactly does that compute to? How much of ice is that? In other words, if I were to take Himalayas here and then somehow melt 368 billion tons of ice, this would raise the level of global um, water by approximately 1 millimeter. So if 368 um, gigatons translates to 1 millimeter, how much does 9 trillion translate to? Well, that's easy to find out. 9.6 trillion divided by 368 billion gives you something around 2.6 centimeters. So this suggests that in the last um, 50 or so years, the water level increased by about 2.6 centimeters or roughly around one inch uh, on average around our planet. And that's actually exactly what we've discovered um, based on observations from different locations. Now, we've also discovered that um, pretty much all major reserves of ice, such as, for example, Antarctica that you see right here, or um, Greenland, which is right here, so here's Greenland going through its summers. Uh, all of these regions have actually been losing a lot of ice every year. In Greenland alone, every single year in the last decade or so, um, approximately 240 billions of tons of ice were lost. And that suggests that uh, this would raise the level of water by about half a millimeter per year. Now, Greenland alone, even though it's not super big, actually stores a lot of ice. And if you were to melt all of the ice in Greenland, the uh, water level around the world would actually raise by about 7 meters. Or, what is that in feet? Like 20, 22 feet or something like that? And that's a lot of water. Um, now, what about Antarctica? Well, if you were to melt all of the water in Antarctica, the water level around the world would actually increase by approximately 58 meters. That is a lot. That's close to about 190 feet. And that, of course, means that some parts of the world will be totally covered in water. Now, we can actually try to simulate some of this in Universe Sandbox by, by moving our planet way, way closer to the sun so all of the ice melts. And then just seeing what happens to some of the uh, seashores here. And by melting all of this ice that we had here, this is kind of how the Earth would transform. Like, for example, Florida is gone now. A lot of other parts of the world are actually also gone, and it seems that um, they're still disappearing, actually. And this is huge. This is basically if you melt all of the ice. And that's, of course, something that, if it ever happens, is going to be devastating to many different countries around the world, because a lot of those countries don't uh, have much elevation above sea level. And so, for example, the place where I'm living right now is most likely going to be completely underwater. So yeah, that's something we might want to actually avoid. But at the same time, we don't expect this to happen just yet. This might take a while before it actually does occur. Interestingly though, look at that, Australia now gets its own miniature sea. But what else do we learn from this particular study? Well, first of all, um, a lot of the ice, um, like I said, is actually stored in Antarctica, but pretty much every major study discovered that both Antarctica and Greenland is losing a lot of ice every single year. And even though there is a lot of ice stored pretty much everywhere around the world, it's really Greenland and Antarctica that we are kind of worried about. And even though there are some regions that actually did receive extra ice, like I mentioned, the one here um, in Southwest Asia seems to have gained a little bit of ice. Overall, on average, pretty much every region lost a lot of it. And in a lot of these cases, in a lot of these studies, uh, because very advanced uh, digital 3D uh, topography models were used, the results are actually very accurate. And even though there's still going to be some skeptics, specifically politicians, that are going to try to say, well, how accurate is this? Because so many studies are saying pretty much the same thing, it's going to be really difficult to wiggle out of that one for a lot of politicians. 
And because this study used so many different resources to try to analyze this data, and because they actually combined data from so many different researchers, it's actually quite comprehensive and probably one of the most advanced to date. But this, of course, doesn't provide the causes. And that's really where the argument, of course, usually starts. What's really causing these changes? Are these human-made or is something else entirely responsible for kind of warming up our planet and sort of removing the ice from our planet and turning it into water? Well, I guess um, this study doesn't actually answer that. It just gives you the results showing that we lost over 9 trillion uh, tons of ice and the worldwide water levels have increased by about 2.6 centimeters or about 1 inch. And that's where you have to start, I guess, doing a little bit more research. And I think one of the best uh, visual tools that I've discovered that allows you to maybe make your own conclusion on what's really causing this comes from Bloomberg. And I've actually used this tool in one of the previous videos and I demonstrated how this works. But let me show you again. So this line here shows you the observed increase in temperature since 1880 until approximately 2015. Now, this is a kind of an average from various locations around the world. And of course, you can debate on whether this is accurate or not, but that's not really the important part. The important part is seeing what else this shows you. The next line shows you the orbital changes of our planet. And as you can see, um, there is actually very little correlation between the orbital changes and the observed temperature. This is solar activity. And once again, as you can see, um, solar activity and the observed temperature also doesn't really correlate very well. Here's various volcanic activity, and um, there actually have been some major uh, volcanic eruptions in the last 100 years. You can actually even see them right here. And once again, um, not really correlated with observed temperature. Here's all of them together, and all together you kind of see that natural factors don't unfortunately explain the observed increase um, in temperature around the planet. The land use uh, around the planet um, is also included here as is the ozone layer that you can see. And we also have um, aerosols released by various activity around the planet. So for the most part, aerosols actually do decrease the temperature because aerosols on average actually either reflect or refract light from the sun, uh, specifically infrared light that comes and warms up our planet. And then we get into other things like, for example, greenhouse gases. And this is not just CO2. Remember, CO2 is actually one of the weakest greenhouse gases. There's a lot of other stuff that we currently produce today that is way more powerful than CO2. There's a lot of greenhouse gases that unfortunately are completely uncontrolled. But what's interesting here is that there does seem to be a bit of a correlation between greenhouse gases and, of course, the observed uh, warming effect. And then when you combine all of these human activities together, and specifically if you actually add them up, they seem to surprisingly correlate really well with the observed temperature. Now, remember, this is correlation, not causation. This is where you, as a thinker and as a viewer, have to make your own decision. So is this really humans causing this, or is it some kind of a natural thing? All factors together is also here, and this is kind of what it looks like. And you can see that the actual observed um, effects really highly correlate with everything. Now, what does this suggest? Well, this suggests that we humans seem to affect a lot of things on this planet, and this warming effect um, is maybe what's causing those ice shelves to melt. It's once again not a causation, it's correlation, and this is really how this particular study helps us resolve the problem of missing or disappearing ice around the planet. Now, um, I guess some people might still not be convinced by this, and some people might not really care, but, well, this is just today, right? Remember, we're still losing a lot of ice every single year. And despite some countries actually proposing things like carbon tax, which was recently introduced in Canada, that's just not really enough. As a matter of fact, it's maybe not even going to be that efficient because think about it. CO2 or carbon dioxide is actually one of the most minor greenhouse gases. There are actually a lot more other gases uh, that are produced by people by human activity that are actually way, way, way more powerful. So despite carbon tax being a good first step toward trying to stop this from happening, it's just kind of inefficient. It's, as a matter of fact, not really enough. And so this is one of those topics where I personally think that education is the best weapon. Essentially, 
understanding how various gases and of course our use of those gases affects the world is really important. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, let's take methane, for example. This is a typical gas produced by various farms around the world. And because we all consume farm products, we have to be really aware of how our overconsumption of certain products may actually inadvertently um, affect the planet in a very negative way. At the same time, things like nitrous oxide, which is a very powerful uh, greenhouse gas, is often produced by uh, very typical chemical factories. And a lot of those chemicals are almost never controlled. So maybe not using certain products to the extreme and being a little bit more conservative with the consumerism might actually help us. Now, I'm not saying don't go and buy everything you want to buy. I'm just saying be aware of this because every single action that we do today unfortunately influences the atmosphere and, of course, the effects of the atmosphere of our planet quite dramatically. Here's actually what uh, PM 2.5 pollutants look like right now, and these are usually very dangerous to your health. But anyway, that's another story for another day. For now, though, I guess what I want to leave you with is... The links. I'm going to provide all of the links for these apps and for specifically this simulation in the description below. You can check it out for yourself and come to your own conclusion. And also, I'm going to leave you with the publication that I mentioned in the description below as well. Now, I know that this is a very divisive topic and I guess some people get really passionate about this, but this is one of those things where science is actually basically telling us only one thing. It's happening. It's really happening. And unfortunately for us, it will probably have a major impact on the planet in the next few hundreds of years. Okay, maybe not this extreme, but pretty close to that. Anyway, on that note, thank you for watching. Hopefully you learned a little bit more about the climate change, the disappearing ice, and of course the simulations that you can use to either teach someone about this topic or specifically discuss this with someone who doesn't actually believe in climate change. And most importantly, subscribe if you still haven't because there's going to be a lot more of these videos coming in the future. And anyway, on that note, see you tomorrow. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Space out. And as always, bye-bye. And yeah, it looks like I basically drowned the whole planet in water. So this is what our planet would look like if it was basically covered in even more water than we have today. North America kind of looks like a really cool looking long continent. And most of Europe turned into islands. It's actually an archipelago now. And the biggest continent and the winner here is Asia, which is actually kind of interesting. A lot of China is still there. And if you're from Australia, I'm really sorry, but there's basically nothing left. Hello, wonderful person. This is Anton. And this right here is what we believe Mars used to be like billions of years ago when it had a very large ocean on its surface. In today's video, we're going to be investigating Mars billions of years ago when it may have experienced a mega tsunami. And more specifically, we're going to talk about the source of that tsunami. And I really wanted to start our story right here. This is Lituya Bay in Alaska. And uh, roughly around 61 years ago from when I'm making this video, something really major happened here. There was a very large earthquake in 1958 in Alaska, and it caused a landslide or a rock slide that literally entered the water almost instantly. And this generated a tremendous wave, a mega tsunami. By some estimates, it was roughly around 500 meters or over a thousand feet in height, because even today we can still see some of the effects with uh, actual trees being stripped away from the lower parts of the mountain and deposited right here at an altitude of almost uh, 600 meters. Now, this is something that uh, was witnessed by two people and they actually described this event. But this was a long time ago and we didn't really study it that well. This was, however, the only known mega tsunami in modern times. And it's something we believe happens when an asteroid strikes a planet with water. Now, we're pretty sure this happened a lot of times here on Earth. But now we think that it also happened on Mars and at least twice as well. And these effects helped us prove that Mars also had very large Earth-like ocean once upon a time, and this ocean may have also existed much longer than we originally thought. Now, this particular paper we've discussed uh, in detail two years ago, it was a very detailed study that specifically pointed out where the mega tsunamis created various visible deposits 
on the Martian surface. This study also indicated that this was probably the best explanation to what we're observing and the best proof to the existence of a very large ocean um, as far back as 3 billion years ago on Mars. They also talked about the existence of two different events. One was uh, approximately 100 million years apart from the other and the younger tsunami, interestingly, happened when Martian uh, ocean was probably already frozen or very, very cold because they explain these unusual observations as basically the tsunami itself just freezing over before it could make it back to the rest of the ocean. So when the second mega tsunami happened, it already was pretty cold on the surface of Mars and it's very likely that the ocean just kind of froze over and afterwards disappeared. But in the more recent study that came out only a few days ago from when I'm making this video, these same scientists identified the crater that they believed is responsible for at least one of these tsunamis, uh, specifically mega tsunamis that created these super large waves. And although technically I guess I could go and try to find this crater right now manually in Space Engine, it would probably take me a while because my Martian geography is not very good. So I'm going to cheat and use Google Maps. Because it just so happens that Google Maps for Mars does exist and is part of Google. Now, uh, we're looking for a very specific crater. And according to the scientists behind this paper, so we know that the ocean was in the northern part of Mars. And we know that the tsunami or the mega tsunami uh, marks were left somewhere right here along the coast. And so the crater has to be somewhere north of that. And specifically, it has to be a crater that shows us signs of being an underwater crater or um, something that is not too deep and has somewhat damaged sides that were most likely damaged by the water as it returned back into the crater. And the one that I'm looking at right now does seem to um, resemble that. It's not too deep, not as deep as some of the other craters. Specifically, it seems to be the same depth as what we think Martian Ocean was. And it also seems to have this unusual erosion on the side that may have been caused by the return of the water as all of the water started flowing back after the collision and also after the mega tsunami receded. If we look up the name of this crater, it's known as the Lomonosov crater named after the Russian scientist. And um, it's around 120 kilometer in diameter basically representing a rock that's maybe a couple of kilometers in size, um, maybe three kilometers in size, that collided with the Martian surface, very likely liquid surface, because its depth is, as I mentioned, uh, similar to what we believe the depth of Martian ocean was. It also meets a lot of other expectations, including the size itself, and uh, the fact that it happened around the same time when we believed there was liquid ocean, and when the tsunami may have occurred as well. So this crater right here might have been responsible, very likely might have been responsible for the mega tsunami, at least one of them, on the surface of Mars. And also very ironically, these tsunamis were the reason why it was so difficult for us to discover the coastal line on Mars. The coastal line was washed away by hundreds of kilometers because these mega tsunamis really caused a lot of the deposits to move across Martian surface and to be somewhat hidden as a result. Now we also believe that this particular crater resembles a lot of the marine craters here on Earth. So it does seem to meet a lot of expectations for the so-called collider with Mars that may have caused these mega tsunamis. But there is another really important finding in this particular paper that may suggest that the Martian uh, ocean was around for much longer than we believed. If this crater occurred roughly around 3 billion years ago, in other words, if this collision occurred about 3 billion years ago, it means that there was still liquid ocean here and it also means that Mars probably had liquid ocean for at least one and a half billion years. And that's enough to create relatively complex bacterial life, just like on Earth. Now, we don't really know if this happened, but the fact that it could happen is quite exciting. And because here we have this model of Mars with an actual liquid ocean, I figured why not try colliding an asteroid with it just to see what happens to the surface. Now I don't think we can simulate a tsunami in the universe sandbox, but we can definitely simulate certain effects. 
And so here, let's try to collide a random comet, like for example, Haley, that's maybe a little bit bigger in size. I think this one is about five and a half kilometers in radius. Uh, so it's practically um, almost 10 times bigger than it should be. But we're going to collide it right there in the ocean and then just see what happens. So this type of a collision definitely happened a lot on Earth as well. And we know that a collision of this magnitude would create tremendous uh, devastation on Mars. So here, after the creation of the crater, the water would recede at first. The tsunami or the mega tsunami would propagate everywhere, creating waves up to about at least 100 meters in height, but possibly even more because Martian gravity is much lower. But then all of this water would rush back and recede into the crater, creating the effects that we observe on the Lomonosov crater. So all of this would be very devastating, extremely powerful, and most likely uh, would have a tremendous effect on the atmosphere of Mars as well. Now we don't really know much else about it other than what we're observing from a distance, so we do have to actually go to Mars and study these deposits in a little bit more detail and possibly investigate the crater as well. Because by studying the Lomonosov crater, we'll be able to discover what actually happens to planets when they receive these tremendous collisions. And since unlike Earth, the Martian craters don't really disappear very fast, by studying the Lomonosov crater, we'll be able to understand what happens to planets like Earth when these super powerful collisions occur. And because not so long ago we discovered at least two really major craters in Iceland that uh, were the result of a very large collision not so long ago with our planet Earth, some people suggest that it might have even happened about 12,000 years ago, learning and understanding the effects of these collisions will definitely help us explain not only what happened to our planet, but also how our species evolved. Because if this collision actually happened 12,000 years ago, we were already around, and it may have affected us quite greatly. Anyway, on that note, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Here's another major collision with Mars, but this time with a very large object, a very large asteroid known as Pallas. Hello, wonderful person, this is Anton, and in this video we're going to be talking about a discovery right here in our own solar system. Actually, two discoveries. Now, I actually left for a couple of weeks, I had to do a few things, and as soon as I left, we started discovering incredible things in our own solar system, in other star systems, and there's going to be a lot of videos in the next few weeks to basically catch up with all of these events. But this one here kind of takes the cake, because it's basically something that was always there, but we never really noticed it. And as you can see from the picture right here, what we discovered is basically rings. Really beautiful, really awesome looking rings that are in the orbit of Venus and also in the orbit of Mercury. Now these are actually two completely separate studies, but it just so happens that they happen around the same time. And interestingly, what these rings suggest to us is that there's a lot of asteroids in the orbit of Venus and Mercury that we've never really discovered, or actually never even looked for. So let's talk a little bit more about this and let's discuss what was really discovered. So, first of all, this is the first paper uh, that talks about the um, circumsolar dust ring near Mercury's orbit by uh, Guillermo Stenborg, and the second paper is by Petr Pokorny and Mark Kuchner, and this is the one about Venus, or specifically the ring around Venus. Now, both of these papers are in the description below, so you can read uh, more about the study itself, but let me actually explain to you how uh, this was basically discovered, how we were able to identify these particular rings. And to discover one of these rings, the scientists used this satellite right here, known as Stereo Ahead. There's actually two uh, parallel satellites, one is called Ahead and one is called Behind. And if you were to look at where they're located, they're located in the same orbit as our planet Earth. And this is actually the orbit here, except that one of them orbits a little bit ahead of Earth and one of them orbits behind Earth. And they're used for uh, various studies, but in this particular case, both of these satellites, or specifically this one actually, uh, were just looking at the sun. And while looking at the sun, they were able to detect something really unusual, specifically dust. They were actually able to see an increase of about 5% uh, of brightness due to dust, or basically reflections from the dust, um, no matter where the spacecraft was in its orbit. And interestingly, 
This only has one explanation, that there is dust pretty much all across the orbit of Venus and also all across the orbit of Mercury. Now, the dust uh, right here, this is the Venus dust, is actually a little bit more well studied. We even know that uh, the thickness here is approximately 15 million kilometers. But the dust ring of Mercury, even though it's kind of smaller, is a little bit more interesting and a little bit more exciting because we never expected to find anything so close to the Sun. Mostly because we thought that because Mercury is so close to the Sun, the um, solar emissions and specifically the solar wind would actually most likely dislodge anything that would be that close to it. And the only way for this ring to actually maintain itself is to have a source of dust. And this is where it gets a little bit interesting. If we were to try to create this ring in Universe Sandbox just to simulate what all of this looks like, if Mercury is right here, then somewhere in its orbit there are at least several hundred um, relatively large asteroids. And these asteroids are most likely responsible for creating all of this dust. Now, um, we're not entirely sure how big these asteroids are, but just based on the amount of dust we've detected, it may suggest that if you were to combine all of this dust into one single piece, it would create a rock approximately three, maybe four kilometers um, in diameter. And all of these rocks are obviously responsible for shedding all of this dust and then depositing it in orbit. And as the sun um, expels some of these dust particles through various activities, such as, for example, solar flares or just solar wind in general, each of these asteroids is then responsible for slowly shedding this dust and creating the ring that we've detected. Now, um, we don't really know the mechanism exactly just yet. We don't even know what's causing these particles to kind of appear as a dust ring. We just know that it's there. And even though we suspected the one around Venus to be relatively large and we kind of knew that it was there, we really didn't expect Mercury to have anything similar. So now we know that um, pretty much every major object in the uh, solar system has these unusual rings. We're pretty sure that Earth has it as well. We just haven't really been able to detect it just yet because it is relatively difficult to see it. And so basically the discovery kind of looks like this. There is the ring um, around Mercury that's a little bit smaller and the ring around Venus, Venus is somewhere right there, um, that's a little bit larger. And this also implies that it's very likely that uh, Venus has slightly more asteroids or potentially that Sun doesn't really have as much influence over um, the region where Venus is located as opposed to the region where Mercury is. Now, we don't really know much else. Like, for example, we don't really know how long this ring will exist or if it's going to expand or shrink. And also, we don't really know its composition just yet. We just know that it's kind of thin, um, and for the most part, the only actual explanation so far is the simulation that was run using, well, actually something similar to Universe Sandbox. Basically, the way that the scientists were able to explain how these rings were formed is by running a simulation for about, well, kind of four and a half billion years, really, and they initially placed approximately 10,000 rocks in the same orbit as Venus. And uh, their simulation showed that even after four and a half billion years, at least 800 asteroids are still going to stay in the orbit here. And they're still going to orbit and um, release the actual dust material. And this dust material um, will then kind of stay around until Sun expels it somewhere to the outskirts of the outer solar system. And even though we don't really know what it's made out of, it's very likely that it's probably rocky and also metallic in, in its composition. So, in other words, it's very likely not ices, not water, not anything that's uh, easy to dislodge by the sun. It's probably something heavy, and for all we know, it might be even precious. But because this is so diffuse, it's actually very, very thin. It's almost like a vacuum here. These particles are really, really far away from each other. In that sense, it's not really that useful other than scientific curiosity. Like there's no way we're going to be able to collect these particles or to in any way use them. It's just going to stay in this orbit until the sun expels it for good. And even a spacecraft that passes through this dust cloud doesn't really have to worry about any collisions or anything because these particles are really far away, really, really small. And um, it would be really, really challenging for us to even find one of these particles. So in that sense, um, it's a really interesting discovery, but doesn't have much practical use just yet. 
It will, however, help us understand our own solar system and the evolution of the solar system, but also help us understand what we're looking at when we're seeing these rings in other star systems as well. And on that note, that's unfortunately all we know right now. As new studies come out, I'm going to definitely mention the follow-up in one of the future videos. But for now, well, that's really it. We discovered two really cool rings in our own solar system around Mercury and Venus. Hello, wonderful person. This is Anton. And in this video, we're going to be talking about, well, actually bad news. It turns out that radiation may have some serious effect on people, especially people wanting to live on Mars. So I'm pretty sure many of us would love to at least visit Mars one day, maybe even live here permanently. NASA is obviously exploring all of these possibilities, but there's obviously a very important challenge to human beings living on Mars. Mars has a lot more permanent radiation basically coming from every direction, not from the sun, from so-called cosmic rays that uh, strike Mars from every direction in outer space. Now, cosmic rays on Earth are usually blocked by the atmosphere, but cosmic rays on Mars are not, because the atmosphere is much thinner there. And as you can imagine, it's much worse on the Moon, where there's no atmosphere whatsoever. So what would happen to human body if we were to expose humans to these conditions, basically to constant, relatively high radiation? Well, it turns out that um, we don't really know just yet, mostly because a lot of these studies were done on mice, including this one I'm talking about today. But we have at least one study um, from the so-called NASA's twin study, where we discovered that there are a lot of different changes that human body will undergo, and some of these changes might even become permanent. But today we're going to be talking about mostly the cognition or the basically mental function when it comes to radiation. Because the study that you see on the screen right now and that you can find it in the description below only dealt with what happens to the behavior and specifically learning and memory when you expose someone to conditions similar to deep space, Mars or the moon. Well, for this study, the scientists picked 40 mice and placed them into radioactive conditions, specifically constant radiation very similar to uh, what you'd experience on Mars. And just for the sakes of the study, uh, the actual radiation was roughly around 1 uh, millisievere per day, which is sort of equivalent to being right here on the flatlands of Mars, and maybe even slightly higher than that. So in other words, they created the radiation conditions very similar to those on the surface of Mars, but much lower than what you'd experience on the Moon. And uh, then they took other 40 mice and placed them in exactly similar conditions, but no radiation. That's the control group. And they had these mice in these conditions for roughly around 6 months, and then took them out and gave them a bunch of tests. Well, what do you think they discovered? Well, turns out... There is a lot of change in these mice after about six months in radioactive conditions. It turns out that pretty much most of them turned into really scared creatures with really poor memory, very poor abilities to perform cognitive tasks, and um, in a sense it was conditions very similar to what you would call PTSD. A lot of these mice experienced what's known as social avoidance, they didn't really want to go anywhere, they didn't want to do anything, they were also afraid of light, um, they were kind of having trouble forgetting the fear, this is known as fear extinction, and most importantly they had difficulty recognizing same um, places or even some of their, I guess you can call them friends or mice that used to live with them. So there was a huge problem with memory and um, cognitive abilities such as performing tasks. Whereas mice that were in control group didn't really change. They had exactly the same conditions, no radiation, but they were totally fine. And having done thorough tests and also thorough examination of the brains of these mice, they discovered that many of these um, effects became permanent. In other words, their brains lost what's known as plasticity, ability to change, and a lot of these mice that experienced the radiation basically stayed um, scared, they became extremely anxious for the rest of their lives, and even after these mice were given uh, time to live a normal life, uh, they basically didn't change at all. And even though this is mice and not humans, a lot of these effects were also observed in the NASA's twin study when it comes to cognition. Specifically, uh, Scott Kelly, who was living in space, 
After he came back, um, he was a little bit slower, cognitively not as fast as he used to be, and uh, there were certain cognitive effects that were somewhat similar to the mice in this study. In other words, the study uh, using mice found parallels with the study from NASA, which unfortunately may imply that all of these effects they discovered might apply to all of the humans that we're going to be sending to Mars, the Moon, and everywhere else in the solar system. The scientists behind the study also mentioned that at least one in five of these mice were definitely affected thoroughly, and this implies that um, if we are sending astronauts to Mars, at least one in five of them might experience very similar, very, very dramatic effects that will make this astronaut unable to perform their tasks. They will be always very anxious, they will be always extremely scared of everything, they will not even remember how to do their own job very well. So that means that we first of all need to be able to bring extra astronauts or redundant astronauts that are able to perform the same task, but also those astronauts that are affected by this and are overcome by anxiety, by extreme stress that um, is similar to what mice experienced, they will need to be able to come back home, otherwise they'll be permanently damaged. They'll have this permanent PTSD effect that is caused by radiation, and that is extremely scary and very unfortunate. And although this particular study didn't really deal with the effects of the sun, like for example the solar flares that might suddenly increase radiation by like thousands of times for several minutes or several hours even, uh, they did study the effects of constant radiation, and that's something we never really considered, because for the most part, our current knowledge of um, the effects of radiation on human body come from things like the Chernobyl disaster that I'm sure you're all familiar with, or um, the more recent Fukushima disaster. Now, these effects are definitely known to us, we know that it can have a tremendous effect uh, on human body, but these are not what's known as chronic radiation effects. These are acute radiation effects from basically sudden increase in uh, radioactive activity. And unless we decide to bring a nuclear reactor to Mars and it suddenly explodes, we're not going to be dealing with these. We're going to be dealing with something more permanent, but also something that's not as dramatic as uh, Chernobyl. Basically, by standing right here uh, on the surface of Mars, you're going to be experiencing uh, something uh, that's approximately 100 times more radioactive than being on the surface of Earth, but it's going to be permanent and it's going to be constant. And this is where this study is really important in discovering that it basically might change your brain. And they even sort of explain how it might happen. The effects that they suggest are happening here have something to do with the way that these cells propagate signals inside the brain. So-called ion channels that are responsible for generating signals inside the brain might be affected by the radiation itself, either through the effects of the actual ionizing radiation itself striking these um, channels, or possibly by introducing these so-called reactive oxygen molecules that are then um, somehow affecting these channels and are causing them to act differently. In other words, the molecular structure of the brain itself is changed by being exposed to this constant radiation. And that's something that we didn't really expect to find, but because the discovery is so profound, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot of follow-up studies, possibly using some other animals that are not mice, that are slightly closer to us, such as, for example, our genetic neighbors, the chimps, that might give us a little bit more clue on what's happening here and also help us understand if this is something that we'll not be able to overcome and if this is something that we need to be really worried about. Because imagine for a second that you have to spend six months on the way to Mars and suddenly some of your co-workers are no longer functioning in the same way, they are experiencing what's known as PTSD, and they are just unable to function. And you can't just turn back your ship, you have to land on Mars. So these are really important findings and um, potentially might create a huge problem for humans when it comes to space exploration. But anyway, until we know more, that's really all I wanted to mention in this video. Hopefully now we know a little bit more about what happens to human body when it's exposed to radiation constantly for a long time. And in some of the future videos, we'll explore this a little bit more and discover what the NASA has found. Hello, wonderful person. This is Anton. And today we're going to be talking a little bit more about Pluto, Charon, the Kuiper Belt, 
and more specifically about asteroids in general. We're actually going to start our adventure right here on Pluto, and this is probably one of the most realistic representations of Pluto we have today. All of this was thanks to the New Horizons mission. As you probably know, um, New Horizons flew by Pluto a few years ago, and it took some incredible photos, and those photos even today are still being analyzed. Now, I want to actually move away from Pluto for a second and go back to, well, actually a little bit closer to Earth. We're going to go to the location known as the asteroid belt. So, if you look closely, Earth is actually right here. This is Mars. And this um, okay, might be kind of difficult to see. Let me change the background color here. So this is maybe a little bit easier to see. There is that ring of the asteroid belt. Now, the asteroid belt is pretty familiar to most of us, but for the most part, uh, many people believe that the asteroid belt is sort of like the closer version of the so-called Kuiper's belt, which is farther away where Pluto is located, and even past Pluto. This is basically where a lot of asteroids and comets usually come from. Now, the thing about it is that it technically makes sense to make that assumption. However, the recent paper um, that I'm going to show you now, there it is. This paper called Impact Craters on Pluto and Charon indicate a deficit of small Kuiper belt objects which kind of actually has a pretty good title that explains what's going to happen here, um, showed us that the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt are actually significantly different from each other in one major way. Let's actually maybe investigate some of the pictures that they have here to try to understand what's happening. So first of all, what the scientists in this particular paper did is they actually looked at the craters on the surface of both Pluto that you see right here, and its partner Charon, which has to be somewhere nearby. It's a pretty close moon. There it is in the back. So there is Charon and Pluto. Now, if I go to Charon, uh, we don't really have as good of a picture of Charon, unfortunately, mostly because um, it was farther away from New Horizons. Uh, but we do have a pretty good picture of Pluto. And because of this, we were able to actually look at the craters and, of course, um, calculate not just the number of the craters, but also their size. Oh, and by the way, every single dot here is a crater. So they found a lot of craters. They were able to actually measure and calculate quite a lot of them. And they've discovered something really interesting. Well, first of all, some regions just don't have craters because there's something like the famous Sputnik Planitia area that's right here. That kind of looks like a heart. Um, that is basically somewhat active in terms of the actual ice flows. And so these ice flows kind of covered the craters. But the areas that do have craters, like, for example, here, if I were to land here, only seem to have large craters, large or medium-sized craters. There's basically no small stuff here. None of these craters seem to be uh, tiny, specifically less than 11 kilometers in diameter. In other words, Pluto and Charon, for the most part, seem to only have craters that are bigger than 11 kilometers, suggesting only medium to large collisions. No small collisions at all. And they've analyzed a lot of the, these craters in these areas. And by the way, did you know there's a place called Mordor Makula? It's named after Mordor in Lord of the Rings. Now you do. Anyway, uh, getting off topic here. So there's a lot of craters that were calculated and measured, and not a single one of them was small. And that's actually a really huge discovery. This literally suggests that uh, Pluto and Charon has actually not experienced any collisions with small bodies, small rocks. The collisions that are so common on Earth, on Mars, on Mercury and Venus, the collisions that basically we think happen everywhere, don't happen on Pluto and Charon like at all. We haven't found a single small crater there, and that is a huge deal. This basically means that um, if we were to travel to the farther uh, reaches of space, um, beyond Neptune, we would most likely not have to worry about any kind of a micrometeorite collision or any kind of a particle strike in our craft. But most importantly, um, this also suggests that this is the main difference between Kuiper Belt and the Asteroid Belt. Asteroid Belt is full of these small rocks, full of these tiny asteroids and meteorites and microparticles that don't seem to exist or at least for the most part are very, very rare in the Kuiper Belt. 
And honestly, their paper was very rigorous. They actually were able to calculate uh, some of the craters very precisely. And they were e even able to identify craters by the amount of possible corrosion they would have from any kind of a um, geological event. And they discovered that none of these craters could have disappeared. The way they reasoned about this is, let's say maybe those small craters just disappeared over time. So why wouldn't the larger craters either disappear or be somehow damaged? And none of the larger craters were even remotely affected, suggesting that there were no small craters to begin with. And honestly, it even becomes uh, quite obvious if you use a program like Space Engine and literally kind of look at the surface uh, closer by and then try to compare it to a surface like of uh, Moon or Mercury. Here is what the surface of our moon looks like and you'll notice right away that there are these tiny spots pretty much everywhere that are very visible and they would have been visible on Pluto as well, but they're just not there. And that's actually a pretty big discovery. Now, um, it's also, of course, somewhat important for our future space exploration because one of the biggest concerns was always micrometeorites, especially if you're traveling at a fast velocity um, across space and trying to escape the solar system. But because we haven't found pretty much um, any small collisions on the surface of Pluto, this to us suggests that um, it's very likely there are no or very, very few of these small rocks that we have to worry about. And that future spacecraft that will actually try to leave the solar system will probably not have to worry about this stuff. They will probably be able to travel in this region at a really high speed and simply focus on avoiding larger objects because smaller objects will be not really hazardous practically at all. And although maybe in the future we'll be able to find some smaller parts here, particles or asteroids or pieces of ice or whatever, for now, um, what this discovery suggests is that this is actually really good news for the future of human space exploration. So honestly, here you could probably have this spacecraft go really, really, really fast and it wouldn't have to worry about anything. It could probably move at ridiculously high speeds and avoid any kind of a collision with micrometeorites that are a pretty big hazard here near Earth and in the inner solar system. And from all of the craters they discovered, they realized that all of the rocks that did smack onto Pluto were at least one kilometer in diameter. So basically, there was nothing smaller than one kilometer. Now, their explanation for this is, um, well, it's actually pretty simple. It's very likely these smaller rocks don't exist here because unlike the asteroid belt that's closer to us, there are just not that many collisions between smaller particles or bigger particles creating smaller particles to create uh, these micrometeorites. The reason we have so many micrometeorites uh, in our part of the solar system is because these collisions happen so much and they create a lot of particles that basically create more particles which doesn't seem to happen as often or possibly even at all on the outskirts of our solar system. So that's probably one of the better explanations right now, but maybe in the future we'll find something that actually will finally answer the question of why this part of the solar system seems to be devoid of smaller rocks. Now that's actually maybe good news, but also a mystery. Anyway. For now, that's all I wanted to mention in this video, as we discover more about asteroids, rocks, and of course, as we discover more about what's happening beyond Pluto, I'll come back and mention this in a future video. So if you haven't subscribed yet, consider subscribing and maybe even share this video with someone who you think might enjoy watching space videos. Also, come back tomorrow to learn something else you may have not known before, and space out, and as always, bye-bye.